皆さんこんにちは、しんぺいです。ということで、今日の、えー、インタビューのゲストは、プロ歴10年以上、ポーカーに関する書籍を5冊執筆しており、えー、そのうちの2冊は日本語にも翻訳されています。えー、グローバルポーカーアワード受賞、ポッドキャストのザ・チップレースのホストであり、えー、ユニベットポーカーのアンバサダーでもあります、アイルランド人ポーカープロのダラ・オカニーさんにお越しいただきました。はい、ダラ、Thanks for joining the show today. Thank you, Shippei. It's a real honor to be here. Yeah, yeah. Well, honor is all mine. And I think、uh, you had a quite a good weekend, right? You had a,、mm. a deep run in a couple of、uh, tournaments? Yeah, yeah. I had a good weekend. I played, I played、uh, a lot of satellites for some live stuff that's coming up here、um, Irish Open, London Poker Festival. Uh, Westport Irish Poker Tour, and I managed to win satellites to all those. I also played the New Year series、uh, that's going on, on, on that was going on on Poker Stars.、Yeah. Um, and I had a deep run in the main event,、uh, ended last night, unfortunately, not as deep as I would have liked, but you know, last three or four tables. And I also went relatively deep in the phase tournament that they ran as well. Yeah, so yeah, I had a good night last night, could have been even better, obviously, but uh. It's, not, it's always nice to go deep. It's a, it's a very exciting feeling. Yeah, let me uh, uh, give you the information how deep you were.、Uh, you're 31st on the New Year's、uh, series out of、uh, 12,790 people. And、uh, $55 one is 70th place out of 1,721. So I would say that, that's you know, quite a good deep run. Like, I've never <laughs> run that deep. So that's congratulations for that. And、yeah. also, last week you won the Twitch、uh, free roll, like Irish、mm-hmm. Poker Tour, too. And how was that opportunity? Because、uh, when I saw the picture, you were like super happy about that. Yeah, I was super, super happy because、uh, there's, there's nothing like winning a live tournament. And you know, even if it was only、uh, a side event at the Irish Poker Tour, it had been so long since I'd actually won a live tournament. It, 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 it did、okay. feel genuinely great. And you know, sometimes. People say, oh, yeah, well, you're very good at making final tables or getting deep runs, but when are you actually going to win a tournament? I, ha- I have won tournaments over my career, but it's been quite, a- it, wa- it was quite a while. I think I had to go back to maybe 2015 since I、oh, actually、yeah. last live tournament. So, yeah, no, it felt absolutely brilliant. Yeah,、um, yeah. I could yeah. see that from your picture. You're like,、uh, really happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, yeah. Yeah. And、uh, at your.、Uh, Po- Twitter post that you, you were putting a 2023 recap. And I think that's something that you were mentioning. You had a lot of caches, a lot of final tables, but no, not winning, actually winning. So that was、uh, something, a summary of the 2023, or maybe like the last few years. Yeah, that was,、uh, that, 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 that was definitely the case with 2023. 2023, I cashed in more live tournaments、uh, than I ever had in my career. And I also made more final tables. But I didn't actually win a tournament.、Mm. Um, uh, so I guess you know, you're always looking at what you could improve or what could be better. So the one thing I did kind of focus on was that I hadn't won a live tournament. Obviously, I'd won lots of tournaments online during the year, but it doesn't quite feel the same. And it was on my mind because you know, different people were saying to me, Oh, yeah, you go deep a lot, but、yeah. you don't win tournaments. And you know, those of us who play a lot know that that kind of Most of the time comes down to just variance.、Um, yeah. I mean, the only thing really difference between, different between this tournament that I won and other tournaments where I went deep is just I ran insanely well at the end.、Yeah. Um, and、uh, that's kind of what you need to win tournaments. But nevertheless,、uh, it, it was something that I wanted to do. So it's, it's quite funny that literally at the first live festival I played in、yeah. the new year, I, I, I went and got that monkey off my back. Yeah, exactly.、Um, Yeah, yeah, definitely a great start of the year. And、uh, also, like, something that you were mentioning that the、uh, more、uh, less online, I, I think you said, is more you're using that to、uh, skill honing. So you're focusing on the live tournament now?、Um, yeah, I mean, over the course of my career, basically when I started, I was almost completely an online player. And、um, I, I played live sort of as a, as a diversion from that.、Um, uh, and I didn't really do anything else. I, you know, I didn't write, I didn't coach,、um, I didn't commentate, I didn't do any of the other stuff that I do now. Over the last 10 years, say, I've started doing more and more of the other stuff.、Um, and something has to give. I've tried to maintain my online volume very high.、Um, Over that period, because I do still love, love playing online. It's probably still the thing I enjoy the most. But I, th- I had the feeling in the last couple of years that I might be better served 
maybe playing a few less tables online and uh, just playing less volume in general, but 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 really focusing on online as a sort of practicing a practice tool or a simulation, not just for not just for live poker, but also for online itself. Um, so you know, rather than playing sixteen tables and making automatic decisions on all sixteen tables, uh, you know, cut back the tables a little bit less. Um, I also feel. I need to put more study in myself away from the tables. Mm -hmm. The game is improving all the time, yeah. and if you're not putting in the study yourself, uh, you will you you will fall behind. A lot of the study I've done in recent years has taken the form of just me teaching uh, students different things. So I I um investigate that myself. But I think this year I want to be a bit more systematic with my study, and 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 put more time into that. So you know something has to give. I can't really cut back on. The other stuff that I do, because uh, well, I enjoy it a lot. Um, so I think yeah, just a bit less, just a bit less online volume this year. That that's not to say that I'm gonna quit online completely and just focus on live. Yeah. Uh, that'll never happen because I prefer online for one thing. Yeah. But but yeah, that's that's basically the plan. Yeah, yeah, and definitely yeah. When you go to live poker, uh, you can use your patch equity, right? You know, you have a Unibet and Jacka yeah. coaching. Yeah, <laughs> that's something yeah. that you you know your presence, right? And I think you can use that too. And yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's like it's very important, obviously, for the sponsors that you be seen out there. They they don't want you just sitting at home uh, grinding fifty five dollar tournaments. And uh, but also, it's it's a great feeling when you go play live. People are so friendly. Um, uh, there's almost nowhere in the world I can go now that people, some people uh, will know me, won't know me, and want to come up and talk to me. And that, that you get you you get great energy from that as well. Yeah, and I think that's something about the I like about about poker that the community aspect. That you know, even you expecting ex accepting my interview is you know, I'm just a recreational poker player, but you're willing to give back to the community and also share the love because you know, how poker is a great game and also it's not player against player. It's it's more of like everyone wants to get better together. I think the helping aspect. So I think that you know you can get actual energy from the fans is great. I, I assume that. Yeah, no, I agree completely. Um, like that's something. The previous thing I did competitively just before, um, just before poker was running, and that's that's very true in in running. Like runners are not really competing against each other. Um, they're 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 just trying to be the best version of themselves. And I think uh, I I get as much satisfaction from when people come up and tell me that you know they bought one of the books and it improved their game and they got satellite into a big tournament because of it, or when I coach students and I see them get uh, get success as I do from my own successes. It's 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 it, you know we we are we are social animals. Yeah. We do we don't want to just sit at home and make as much money as we can for ourselves. Uh, we do have this need to for 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 community, and it's and it's something. And the poker community is so diverse as well. Like it's genuinely global. You can go anywhere in the almost anywhere in the world and play poker and, or, or or meet poker players, and you just get people uh, for all ages, um, all different professions. It's really important to keep trying to grow the game and popularize the game so that it doesn't just become a niche uh, activity. Um, and that and that's something that uh, has always been very important to me. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, whatever the background you are and what kind of language you speak, you sit down, you know, play the cards. You know, you don't have to have that. You you can have like certain, you know, uh, what do you call interaction together. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And uh, I I like to uh, touch on the coaching section that the uh, you, you mentioned that you genuinely only help the people you can you think that you can help, and that's something I really aspire. You know, just like I I think that's great mentality to have because. Uh, and as a Japanese poker community getting better and bigger, a lot of people you know providing coaching, but I don't think many people have the same mentality as you. You just you know taking money, but like you you actually do tell the student if the student's not going to make it, you just going to uh, tell them right. Like that that's I think that's great. Yeah, absolutely. Like sometimes people come with unrealistic ambitions. They think you know they'll get a, they'll, they'll get a few sessions with me and 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 then they'll be uh, top class players. And and you know, often all I'm really doing is just steering somebody in the right direction. I'm just teaching them how to think about the game, what tools to use to study themselves. And in, in many cases, they are successful. Um, you know, there are there 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 are players that I coached in that sense. You know, it, it, a, a few years ago, who are now better poker players than I am. 
Um, oh. That's mostly on them because, you know, they, they put in the work and the time studying, but it was still very important for them to be pointed in the right direction and to think about the game correctly from the start, uh, have the right conceptual framework. But then there are other players who very quickly realize this isn't going to work. It's just unrealistic. Um, and I think it's important to be honest with them and tell them that, that look, um, and, and then there are some students where I just quick, quickly feel the way they think about poker, the way they want to approach it, it's not the same way that I would, but there are other coaches who could, who could possibly help them. And in that case, I'll say, look, I honestly think you're wasting your money uh, uh, doing any more sessions with me, but you could possibly try these other coaches. Uh, they might work better for you. And I think, you know, like the motivation for me is not to make as much money as possible from coaching. Coaching is just a, a sideline for me. It's something I enjoy doing with students. There, there's no better feeling than taking somebody who, uh, you know, from a very low level and bringing them up to a very high level and also making them excited about the game. I think that's that's super important. I think a lot of coaches just focus on trying to teach the technical information and um, do it in a very dry fashion. But what I always try and engender in my students is, is a genuine passion for the game. It's a fascinating game. It's it's incredibly rich strategically. Yeah. Um, and if if I can communicate that to the students that they are genuinely excited to go off and study themselves, um, then that's probably the best thing I can do. At the end of the day, it is the kind of thing no no one coach is going to turn you into a, a crusher. Most of the work has to be done yourself. All the coach can really do is put you on the right road and point you in the right direction um, and motivate you to to get there. But mm -hmm. you know, yeah. So, so so that's what I see as the uh, the what 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 the coach can provide. It's not a case of you know you teach the student absolutely everything. You essentially teach the the student how to teach themselves. Yeah, basically, uh, show the tool what kind of tool you can use and how to use them. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly yeah. And okay, I, I think I'm going to uh, connect that the question to the one that I was planning to ask you later. But the, what kind of characteristics do you see for successful students? Any uh, common characteristics? Yeah, uh, there's a yeah, there, there there are some very common characteristics. Uh, there, there, there's a certain temperament uh, which I identify as sort of like patient and disciplined um i think patience and discipline are super important work ethic is also super important um there are certain characteristics which make it difficult to rise to the top um being too uh having too big of an ego yeah. most yeah. of this most of the students i know who become uh the best have come to me with with a lot of self doubt and said I I don't think I'm very good at poker I'm not sure I'm ever going to be good they're they're, they're acutely aware of their own failings um mm. and some players come to me full of confidence and in my experience it's much better to be un underconfident than overconfident when it comes to poker uh play, play, players who think they know everything or they will know everything very quickly get disappointed very quickly players who come with a very humble attitude of i don't know very much and uh i'm not sure i'm i'm, I'm ever going to be very good at this game they, they they generally end up surprising themselves um and i think that's true even as they get to the top like some of the best players i know still constantly beat themselves up over the way they play hands to, mm. to not knowing certain spots i think in this game if you get too comfortable with where you are in terms of your own game it's not a good thing because you know it's it's an infinite it's an infinite game tree you have to keep learning um the 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 general standard just gets better and better over time inevitably because what, what happens is players who stay in the game and work hard at it get better yeah. players who uh who are left behind will reach a point where they're losing too much and they'll tend to stop so so, so th this is this is a constant process and if you're not keeping up uh, with with that, you're going to fall behind. Like one of the things I say now is that I think the average recreational player now is better than the average top class pro was even seven years ago. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, so top class pros back seven years ago thought probably walked around thinking, oh wow, I'm brilliant, I'm one of the best players in the world. Yeah. And now, if 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 they were transported forward seven years and you put them into an average tournament, they would be getting wrecked by recreational players yeah, and they yeah. wouldn't know what. To yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, impressive that how poker uh, game itself evolves so, so quickly, even after the GTO. But the uh, before the GTO, everyone's talking, and 
not compared to seven years ago, a hundred years ago. It's just completely different games, I think. Yeah. And uh, the characteristics about that. So would you say like open-minded too? Like you have to be open-minded. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Be, be, being open-minded as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it, it's, it's, it's a really funny thing. Like when you ask a poker player, their opinion on a hand, the, the player who knows nothing will say, well, I don't know. I'm not sure because I don't know. And, and the player who, who, who is, who's good, but not great. Let's say often will have a very, very clear opinion and say, absolutely. This is what you should do hundred percent of the time. But then you go up to the next level, the, the really best players. And again, you can't, you're kind of back to the indecision. They're not too sure. They say, well, it kind of depends on what the other players are doing. What's this guy doing? What stage of the tournament is it, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, I, I think, I think um, I I incredible self confidence and dogmatism and lack of open mindedness is a mark of the the sort of middle tier, the mediocre, if you want to call it. The, the, they're they're not they're not bad, but they're not good either. Um, they're somewhere in between. Maybe they're not understanding how complex poker is and how situation based it is. And yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's it. Um, great friend of mine, Annette Carroll. Uh, she has a great phrase, which she says everything is situational, yeah. and, and it really is. Like when I started coaching, it was with a group of other players, and we, we were coaching players that we were staking at the time. And I do remember at the time that the other guys were much clearer in their thoughts of, as to what should be done. Whereas yeah. every time they asked me, my answer tended to be, "It depends." Yeah. To the point that that was it, it, it was a running joke in our group. That was their nickname for me. It depends because that, that, that was <laughs> But I think that that is, that that is the answer to most most poker situations. You know, sometimes people start telling me a hand, and they're they're just like, "Well, I had Ace Queen off under the gun, and I moved all in." And like, I'm like, "Well, that's not enough information. It depends on your stack. It depends on what the other players are. It depends on the stage of the tournament. The, 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 it depends on what hands you've shown down recently. Or oh, there there are so many factors you have to consider." um in poker and and you should always be looking for new factors as well um you know the um the solver era let's call it uh, which which started about 10 years ago that has changed things as well because now players are much more studied in certain spots um and you know that for example they're that that, that they're calling off ranges or, or their shoving ranges are likely to be closer to correct than they were before the solvers um, but then, you know, maybe you're playing somewhere where they've never heard of solvers. So okay. there are so many factors you have to consider, even, you know, it might be the end of the evening and they're all tired and they're likely to make a tired mistake or a frustrated mistake. Um, yeah, there's just so much you have to think about, particularly when you're playing live o online. Obviously, if you're playing 12, 16 tables, you, you have to automate a lot of your decisions, but live, there's always information there, um, uh, uh, that you, that, that you should be paying attention to. Yeah. And uh, we would like to go back to all the way to your childhood now and uh, how you started your, uh, even before poker career, like how was your childhood? Like what kind of child you were? Like you were into intellectual puzzle game or more active in the physical? Um, I, I was not at all active physical. I, 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 I was a very sick child. Um, I, I, I had health problems all through my childhood which which made it quite an isolated childhood as well i like we had i had very little interaction with anybody outside of my own immediate family i was very close with my brother and we were both absolutely obsessed with all sorts of strategy games um we played pretty much every strategy game we heard about uh probably about 100 card games yeah. uh, including incidentally poker but it was draw poker uh we played loads of board games every strategy game we could think of we even invented our own strategy games when, when oh. we ran out of games we had uh we and uh yeah so right from the start obsessed by strategy games didn't play much sports because i was physically uh quite ill which is um i, I remember I on, on my, I, I also very intellectual i read a lot um i was very very much consumed by ideas and um yeah that was that that that, that was kind of the, the 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 way my childhood went um really loved strategy games right from the start and um you know played chess at a pretty high level um played uh, played played bridge later uh, played another card game similar to bridge that's popular in Ireland called Whist. so right from the start that was sort of what i competed in that that was my sports because i wasn't naturally good at sports um, so I did these other things. I, I remember on my last day in uh, in high school, my best friend said to me, um, he was obviously trying to uh, to motivate me, but a very good friend in that sense. He said, you could achieve anything you want in life. And then he thought for a minute and he said, well, obviously, 
anything except anything to do with sports uh, because I was terrible at sports at the time. Now, because I'm so competitive, I didn't think I didn't take from that. Oh, that's great. He, he thinks I'm good at everything else. I was like, why can't I be good at sports? So I actually got obsessed with running for a while and, 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 and made it a point. And, you know, 15 years later, when I was running for Ireland, uh, sent him a message and saying, yeah, you were wrong about the sports thing. Um, <laughs> but yeah, but that's, yeah, so my childhood engendered a couple of things in me, Re uh, hu huge interest in intellectual pursuit and in uh, reading um, and, 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 and figuring things out, massive interest in strategy games and hyper -com competitivity. Like I was driven by I had to be better than my brother at every game that we tried. Yeah. And the way we would do is we would we would find out of a new game, we'd learn it, and then we'd play against each other and we'd play until we both got as good as we were going to get. And then one of us would be better than the other. And then that game was over. We, we we figured out who was better and we'd move on to the next game. So, you know, he was better at chess than I was. So I stopped playing chess. Okay. I was better at bridge than he was. So he stopped playing bridge. Um, and that's the way it went. But but that sort of intense competition was, was built in from the start. So I think that's something which helped me later on as well. Yeah. And the... Uh... Uh, it's kind of surprising because I, I when I was doing uh, your uh, research and, you know, obviously you're ultra marathon runner, winner too. So it's surprising to figure out that you were actually a sick child. And so is that actually the motivation that friends that you gave kind of trying to prove you prove him wrong? So you started running like a Forrest Gump and you know, I just like. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it did. It, it didn't happen immediately. Um, you know, I still came out of my childhood pretty sick and unathletic. But as I, you know, got through my twenties, my my health improved a lot. And yeah. by the time I got into my early thirties, well, two things had happened. First of all, I didn't have my my those health problems anymore. But I was also somewhat out of shape. Um, okay. You know, I enjoyed my twenties a lot. I'm an Irish person, so I drank a lot of beer and ate a lot of bad food. Um, so in my early thirties, I was overweight and I thought, okay, well, I probably, I'm, I probably need to do something about that. So I started running purely to, uh, purely as a, let's get a bit fit, let's get a bit fitter thing, but you know, hyper competitive. So as soon as I started doing new, something new, I was like, well, I have to be as good as I possibly can be at this thing. So I went from, you know, b being able to run, not even being able to run a kilometer without, without being completely out of breath to, uh, to, 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 to running marathons. And I ran marathons most through most of my 30s. And then in my late 30s, I decided to try the even longer stuff, the ultra marathons. And by then I was actually pretty good at running. And it turned out I was just a natural when it came to ultra marathons. Um, it's, 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 it's a weird sport, but it's mostly in the mind. It's just about how much pain and suffering you're willing to endure uh, <laughs> to run ridiculously long distances. Um, I mean... When I when I did it, the Japanese were the best at it. So <laughs> maybe, yeah, yeah. You guys know all about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think uh, yeah, we we do pretty well in you know, a long distance and also swimming, something like yeah, more mental the aspect of the sports. Yeah, yeah, I think we do uh, pretty well. But yeah, so you actually turned to professional running runner at age yeah. of thir uh, thirty nine or forty or. Something. 39 yeah, yeah. It, 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 it would have been then but i'm prof professional is, is is stretching it i mean i was paid to run but it wasn't enough to live so i was doing other stuff as well but yeah nevertheless i was paid to run it's essentially what happened was i started out as a terrible runner i got i get i got better at marathons to the point where i was ranked in the top let's say one percent mm. um but i wasn't elite elite and then um at the end of my 30s when i realized i was getting slower I decided I'd try ultra running, which I'd heard about and, and was fascinated by while I was still in shape. So I went straight from the Dublin Marathon. A couple of weeks later, I ran the New York Ultra Marathon. I had no real idea what to expect. It was just an experience. And I remember standing on the starting line and looking around and, and trying to think, well, who, who, are, the, who are the good guys here? Because I didn't know anything about the world of ultra, ultra running. And there were some young, very fit looking guys who had TV camera crews with them. I thought, well, I guess they're the best runners. Um and then the race started and, you know, I found myself in a, in, 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 in the lead group of four and the, those, those guys were at the back. They were, they, they were further back. I, and I asked, I remember asking one of the guys who seemed to know about what's the story with those guys. And he said, Oh, they're triathletes. They're just using this as training for something oh, else. Yeah. Um, they're not the actual top ultra runners. And so, uh, yeah, it was, it, it was a real baptism of fire. I ended up winning that race much to my own surprise. I, I, like, I literally couldn't believe I, it, you know, I, I, 
I would have taken any bet that I wasn't going to win because I just, <laughs> just it, it, it never even entered my mind. But it turned out, yeah, that, that I was just naturally built for ultra ultra running. Um, it is mostly in the mind. It's mostly about being able to to, to endure uh, discomfort at the start and genuine pain and suffering by the end. And that sort of kickstarted my running career. It, it, it made a decent amount of news back in Ireland that you know this this unknown Irish guy had won the New York Ultra Marathon. Um, I was selected to run for the uh, for Ireland in the in the twenty four hour championships and yeah. uh, other races. So the government were paying me basically to keep to keep running for a while. Uh, yeah, I was about to mention that the twenty four hour running championship in the Irish they won. That's probably the most mentally, you know, <laughs> the exhausting and the uh, pure pain, right? Yeah. Oh, that 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 absolutely was pure pain, and I had no, uh, I had no preconception of what it was going to be like, other than it 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 sounds absolutely horrific. Yeah. I mean, I remember the run up to this was I was selected to run my first race for Ireland, which was a hundred kilometer race in in Scotland. And it didn't go very well uh, because I I was sick on the day. I had um I had a uh, chest infection. Oh. I had digestive problems as well, so I wasn't able to keep food down during the race. And when you're running long distances, you have to be able to eat during the race because it's too long to go uh, just on what you've eaten before. And I also had an Achilles tendon problem. So there were a lot of problems. And I came out of that race completely wrecked and thinking maybe these really long distances are not for me. And... Ireland at the time actually had a, had had some very good uh, twenty four hour runners. Um, it was a bizarre anomaly that a small country at the same time produced a number of guys who were all top one hundred in the world, and they wanted to send a strong team to the World Championships in Canada. And they had, I think, they had a last minute pullout, so they needed one person to make up the numbers, uh, and the only person they. Uh, could think of who could possibly make up the numbers with me even though I'd never run 24 hours so they asked me if I do it and initially I was like oh, this sounds like a terrible idea <laughs> I didn't enjoy the 100 kilometers at all um running even longer seems seems worse but I spoke to my coach uh who is very well known in the world of ultra running uh, a Scottish guy based in South Africa Nari Williamson um he's written a, a great book on ultra running called the lower of, of distance running and he was like no, you can actually do it. It's fine. <laughs> all, all the training you've been doing the last six or seven years is kind of what you do for this. Um, he he had me doing some specific extra training, uh, which was mostly designed to just get me used to running when I was already very tired and okay. also running and eating. So the, 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 the things I had to do different in the preparation for that race was I would get up in the morning, I'd have an absolutely massive breakfast, eat as much as I could, and then immediately go out and start running. Okay. Uh, and and th and that was just to condition my body to uh, to digest on the run, um, mm. which which had had been which was probably my biggest problem on my Irish debut in Scotland. So it felt terrible at the start, but I did get used to it. It's like anything else; the body will get used to it eventually and and, and be able to do it. And then the other thing he would have me do is he would have me do a really long run in the morning, come home completely tired, uh, take a few hours off, and then go out and do another really really long run. And that that was to get me to get my body used to running when I was already tired, um, which is super important in a twenty four hour race because after the first five hours you start to get tired, yeah. and after twelve hours you're extremely tired and you still have to run another twelve hours. So uh, that was basically the 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 the, uh, the background to that. The the race was held in um, in Canada in Quebec, okay, in the middle of their summer. So uh, the the, the weather conditions were really bad for Irish people. Um, very, very warm, 35 degrees okay. Celsius, I think, but also 90% humidity. Mm -hmm. um, so there were people from very hot countries. I remember uh, some of the Africans and some of the Australians, and they were really struggling in the conditions because uh, they were genuinely hot and unpleasant. Um, I found out that day that I had some weird genetic anomaly where I'm just very good at running in heat. It didn't bother <laughs> me too much at all. Um, and you know, I was looking at the the Africans who were falling by this by the wayside, going like, "What's wrong with them?" Uh, <laughs> but, but they were they, they were suffering from heat exhaustion. I wasn't. Uh, wow. It's it's just one of those weird things. Like we all have these weird genetic anomalies, which we probably don't know about until we're tested. Like when I was running for the Irish Ulster running team, there was one guy who was amazing in in cold. He won the the first South Pole marathon, and wow. you know, okay, maybe that's a little bit more. Uh, unsurprising for an Irish person, but there was another guy who was the first uh, Westerner to win the Himalayan marathon. 
um, because he was very good at altitude. Now in Ireland, we don't have any mountains. We have hills. Okay. We don't have mountains. So, so for an Irish person to be good at that stuff, again, it's just a weird genetic anomaly. And yeah. I would never have suspected it because I don't particularly like heat. Like when I'm walking around in Vegas in summer, I find it hot and unpleasant and not something I want to spend too much time in. But when it comes to actually performing in the heat, I'm fine. Um, I just, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of built for that. So the, the, the first 24 hour world championships went very well. I was there to make up the numbers. Mm. Um, but I was the first Irish person, uh, home, um, well, not the first, I ran the longest, obviously in 24 hour races, it's, it's, it's whoever runs the longest, but it was an incredibly, uh, horrific experience. Like, <laughs> I wrote about it on the blog. I ended up in hospital for the next, mm. uh, 24 hours. Um, I collapsed at the end of the race. I, I I woke up and two doctors were arguing in French because it was Quebec about what I was going to die from, if I was going to die from liver failure or heart failure, um, because everything had sort of uh, uh, swollen up as a result of the race. But it's actually fairly normal for uh, ultra runners to, it looks like they're they're dying at the mm. end of it, but actually they recover very quickly. And yeah, 24 hours later, I was fine. I was fine. Well, I couldn't walk. My feet were still swollen. Uh, there's some some pictures of me like being wheeled around uh, in a wheelchair in Toronto airport by my teammates. Um, but a few days later, I was back out and running again. So that's one of the things about ultra running. It's it's driving yourself to that point where uh, the the point of collapse essentially. But then, if you have done the training um, and you are naturally designed for it, you'll recover really, really quickly. And I think that's something that the uh, you unexpectedly prepare for your online grinding career, you know, like a poker too. So I would like to know like how you switch from that running to poker. Yeah, that happened. Um, basically, what as I said, like I've always done something competitive. Yeah. Uh, in my late teens, early twenties, it was chess. And then when I reached as high as I could go in chess and I realized I wasn't going to get better, I was never going to be a grandmaster, I kind of lost interest in chess and I, I turned to bridge. And then I played bridge for a few years and I, I, I was one of the best in the country. Um, and then for a combination of reasons, I stopped doing that. Um, I got married, my my bridge partner moved away, et cetera, et cetera. And then running sort of took over in my 30s and I just wanted to get as good as I could at that. When I got genuinely good at ultra running and to the point that I was winning races and competing for Ireland, it gave me a real taste of competing at the at the very highest level uh, at, at something that I was genuinely international class at. And that 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 felt great to me. But, you know, by now I'm into my early 40s and I, I'm, I'm aware that time is not on my side and this isn't going to last forever. So already I was starting to think, well, what 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 can, what will I do after running, uh, you know, when I'm not? top class competitive runner anymore um so i was already thinking of other stuff to do i i, I looked around the world of ultra running and i saw that there were guys who were able to do it at the top level all to their 40s but 50 seemed to be the sort of longest i could expect to keep competing at that level so my my plan was okay well i'll keep, I'll keep running uh through my 40s and but by the end of my 40s i need to have found something else that i'm that that, that i can do and play well uh, and be competitive at. And I saw uh, the Irish Open on TV, uh, the Poker Open, and I just remember looking at the field and, you know, it was people of all ages, sizes, shapes, and thinking, oh, wow, it, it looks like you can be competitive at this uh, when you're older, um, which kind of made sense to me because, you know, I knew from my youth that strategy games are, don't really have a physical component. So I thought, okay, poker looks like something I could do so my original plan was, OK, I'll, 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 I'll look into this poker during my 40s and maybe by the age of 50, as the running starts to phase out, I'll be able to do the poker. Um, and my brother was already playing poker. Um, uh, he was, I guess you'd call him semi-professional. He was making money from it, but not enough to live. And so I, so I got him to teach me. Um, and as I said, it was it, it, it was sort of a long, steady plan of like, I'll just do this on the side for the next seven or eight years and then hopefully i'll be good enough to play at, at at a pretty high level but like everything else as soon as i started doing it i got completely obsessed with it um i was just playing thinking about poker studying which is different from studying now but you know any, any books i could find i was reading mm -hmm. um uh I, I, I was thinking and talking about poker all the time 
um and back then it was kind of the boom of online poker um if you were even half decent at the game you could make a decent and you could, you could make a lot of money from it so in my right from the start i was winning online um i was making money and by the end of the first my first year playing i was actually making more money playing online than i was from uh, my main job at the time which oh. was a, an it consultant so and I, and to be honest, I was bored with my job anyway. I was kind of looking, and I was like, "Well, this is this is actually pretty good. I can I can I can actually make enough money to support my family now just playing poker." So that's how the transition happened. Now, unfortunately, and and this is probably my only regret with poker, but I got so consumed with poker, the running sort of fell by the wayside. Mm -hmm. I I I tried to do the two of them, uh, for about a year or so. Like I still competed. I think I I, I went to two more World Twenty Four Hour Championships. But I just wasn't at the top level anymore because poker was taking too much out of me. I was I was absolutely consumed by poker. I was still doing the training I was supposed to do for running, but instead of resting and sleeping uh, as much as I was, I was sitting in front of my computer playing online poker, okay. and the recovery just wasn't there. So um, my my body wasn't getting that recovery period that's vital for distance running, and yeah, my running career just tapered off at that point. Um, but it had been replaced by a new passion. I, I, I was far more interested in poker at this stage. And because I was successful right from the start and actually making a lot of money, like I made poker was something I could make enough money that I didn't have to work. Um, running was never going to be that. Um, the, 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 those two things put together meant that poker kind of just replaced running. How long uh, did it take for you to be better than your brother? Um, it happened almost immediately, much to his horror. Um, it was, <laughs> it's pretty, it's pretty funny because he, I, I mean, if we if we tallied up all the games that we played and 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 it has to be over a hundred, he's probably been better at more than half of than me than, than me. But there are a few of them that stand out that I'm just way better than he is. Poker is one, bridge is another. All, 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 I guess the card games in general, my, my mind was just better suited to them. Um, I think what it was is that I have a better understanding psychologically of people oh. than he has. So, so any pure game like chess, uh, he's likely to be better at. But any game that has a psychological component, I'm likely to be better at. Oh. And yeah, it got, it, it, I mean, but he had been playing poker for, I don't know, seven or eight years fairly seriously before me. Oh. And again, something happened as in our childhood. As soon as it became obvious that I was much better than him, he just stopped playing. Um, and and unfortunately, he doesn't play anymore. People people at the start in Ireland remember, you know, that I used to travel to all these tournaments with my brother. But you know, by the end of my first year, I was already seen as one of the top players in Ireland. And um, I think he found that quite difficult because he'd been doing it for for much longer than I had. Um, um, but but he did teach me very well. And uh, you know, for that, I'll always be grateful to Sean. And uh, I'm. <laughs> I'm sorry he doesn't play anymore. <laughs> Just kind of crushed his ego, eh? Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. And uh, you, I, I think that's something that really stands out, your career that you used right at the get-go. You were just like skyrocketed. And you usually people have certain period that you you know can i do this and that poker is poker is you know for me, but like you were just right there. So let me ask you, what was your routine like you you already in the pro so what kind of routine did you implement it yeah my as i said like i got i got i got completely obsessed with poker to the point that i would get up um i was still running obviously so i, I tended to do my my running training uh before before i ate and then i'd have breakfast and then my job involved me sitting at the computer uh for most of the day but al but already like it was it was situation L like a lot of jobs you really only have to work an hour or two and then you're waiting for certain stuff to happen mm -hmm. um or, or waiting for meetings or whatever so I had a lot of downtime so I started playing online uh poker uh, right from the start and I absolutely loved online poker I, the fact that you could just you know sign on to a site and play straight away yeah. um that just absolutely I I just completely fell yeah. in love with that yeah me too and so 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 yeah I, I started out. You know, I was 42 years old at this stage, so I wasn't exactly a, a kid who was used to playing uh, online computer games. So I started out quite slow. I remember I was playing one table at the start and really focusing and just trying to learn the game. Uh, I was, I, I, you know, I was thinking about every spot and, you know, OK, well, not, when I have this hand, what should I do? But if somebody else does this, how strong is my hand now? So a lot of it was just thinking from fundamentals because there were no solvers back then. There were no training videos 
you really had to kind of figure everything out yourself. But that kind of suited me because I was used to that anyway. That was that's kind of the way my mind works. Um, so I learned a lot uh, just by you know playing one table and hyper focusing. And then I reached a point where um, I was aware that people who did this professionally played more than one table. Uh, I had a very good friend at the time, Rob Taylor, uh, who uh, actually taught me a lot in the early days. He was probably my second grade poker teacher after my brother. And he was like, yeah, you have to play more tables. Um, so I added a second table. And in the beginning, I was like, this is this is too much. This is too frantic. There's a hand over here. And now I have to make this decision here. But, you know, like anything else, practice makes perfect. I built up. Um, and I think by the end of the first year, I was already eight tabling um, uh, fairly competently. Because, you know, obviously you reach a point where most of your decisions are automatic. You know, you look at the table, you've got jack three off under the gun. You don't have to think about it. You just fold. Uh, you look at another table, you've got an ace on the button again. Nobody's raised. You don't have to think about it. You just raise. So I, I, I sort of learned through repetition over the first year. Um, but I played really long hours. Like, I'm pretty sure that I played from, from, from the first day I played, which was uh, sometime in May 2007, until 2013, I played online poker every single day. I didn't take a day off. Wow. Most of those days, I played 10 hours. Uh, sometimes I played, sometimes uh, on Sundays, I played 14 or 16 hours. I'm pretty sure for the first six or seven years, I was playing, I played 70 to 80 hours a week online, and I didn't take a single day off. Uh, let me um, tell you, uh, let me ask you then, the, uh, what, what, what did you do on... 2011 april 15th black friday did you still play i still played yeah yeah um i remember um <laughs> i remember I, I remember distinctly because I, at the time i did most of my volume on full tilt and stars yeah. and i remember i had started my grind and i got a message from a young friend of mine john O'Croot, uh, who was a really good online player He's retired these days. He owns a bar in Limerick, but he uh, he he was one of the best at the time. And he said, "Take all your money off full tilt now." And I was like, "Why? What's the problem?" And he said, "There's something big happening. We don't know yet, but just get your money off now." Oh. So I pulled all my money off. I I I I remember. I actually no. What I did was I messaged somebody I knew who worked for full tilt, and I said, "I got this weird message from Jono saying I'd be better off taking my money off full tilt now." And the person in full tilt said, "Yeah, you would be better off taking." No. <laughs> So I was one of the lucky ones who didn't lose 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 a cent in full tilt. Wow! Do you uh, do you know how? Like it was a week before or a few days before? No, it was literally the day, but but it was early wow. in the day. Um, it was before the the famous DOJ n notice went up. So I I pulled the money off. I didn't know what was happening, and then obviously during the day it kind of filtered out what was happening. I was still playing online. I wasn't playing on full tilt, obviously, but I was playing on. Um, in 2011 it would have been mostly stars um with some of the other sites as well so i remember playing for most of the day and just you know checking message boards and seeing what was going on and seeing there was a big deal um and then i remember the the, the aftermath of it basically when when stars came back and full tilt didn't um but suddenly all the americans were gone yeah and um for a few months it was actually very good it was it, it, it was weird but like the americans were genuinely the best players in the world at the time um because obviously poker came out of america so player so american players had more experience so for a period online poker was really good even though the pools were smaller i think we lost about 40 percent of the world's uh players online at, just in one fell swoop on black friday but but the 60 percent who left who were left were generally weaker so i remember for the next few months i grinded really hard online because it was really profitable to do so and then gradually the best americans started coming back as they started, as they moved uh, to you know Costa Rica or Canada or wherever, um, and the pool got tougher again because essentially what had happened now was all of the weaker American recreations were gone from the pool, but the better professionals, uh, after a period of not being there, were, were back again. Yeah. So it was a really bizarre time uh, in uh, in poker. But yeah, like everything else, I just played through it. I was like, yeah, well, wow. this is what I do every day now. So. Um, it's yeah it's, it's quite funny yeah. now then i have to ask that even you went through the black friday you still played and what was the first day you took a day off what happened 
Uh, yeah, around 2013 or so, I start, I, I I had a new group of friends and we were staking uh, some, some Irish players at the time. And I was starting to do other stuff as well. I was... Um, I was spending more time writing. Um, I had started to do some commentary and I was doing some coaching now with the guys and 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 this this stuff was taking more time. So it got to the point where I was getting more and more stressed doing all this stuff, but also trying to play every day right. um, and still play the same long sessions. And um, uh, one of my friends, one of my best friends at the time, still one of my best friends, the guy I do the podcast with, David Lappin, he said to me, like, you can't really keep this up. You're going to have to start taking days off. He, he kind of said it as a joke at the start because it was it was a sort of a running joke that, you know, uh, Doke just doesn't take days off. <laughs> but um, but he was like, you're going to have to you're going to have to take days off. And I I, I, I don't remember the first day I managed to do. It. I, I remember a few unsuccessful attempts where I, you know, I decided I was taking Wednesday off because it wasn't it wasn't a particularly good day online. And I would get up in the morning and I'd do my stuff and I'd tell my wife, I'm not playing today. And she'd be like, really? But you play every day. And I was like, no, no, I'm definitely not playing today. And then, uh, you know, I'd do, I'd do whatever else I had to do. I'd go out for my run um, and do any coaching or whatever I do. And then by six o'clock, I'd be watching TV. And then by seven o'clock, I'd be really restless yeah. and think, OK, well, the, uh, the Big 55 is starting now. And this other tournament on iPoker that's really good. And I'd end up going off. I can't do this. I'm going. I'm, I'm going back to play. So I'd end up just starting late that day. So there were there were several false attempts before I did manage to finally force myself to take a day off. Yeah. Um. Yeah, even I mean, now, yeah. like I'm pretty bad. Like when I take days off, it's it's a day off from playing online, but it's not really a day off because I do all the other stuff that I do. You know, we record ship race stuff. I write. I coach. Um. I'm I'm really bad at doing nothing. Uh, like <laughs> I just don't, I just don't enjoy it. I get really restless. Yeah, and, uh, doing something. Yeah, I, I can imagine. Like uh, when you were trying to rest and watching TV, and you were just like fingers just doing this moss creak, and just like, oh, oh, itchy finger. <laughs> yeah, it's and, and and that's the thing. Like it's, I enjoy it so much. It's you know, I, I have a friend who uh, uh, did a doctor's in addiction. And she was convinced for a while that I was actually addicted, that, mm. that it was that, that it was an addiction. But we kind of went we went deep into it. And then she kind of went, well, it's not actually an addiction because it's just something you really, really enjoy doing. Um, and, you know, it's similar to other addiction, or so, so, so other compulsions, let's say, that you've had in the past where, you know, you used to run or you used to play chess all the time or you used to play bridge. But with all of those things, uh, well, apart from the running, um, there re there came a point where you just stopped and and you were able to stop. So that's kind of one of the things which shows that it's not an addiction. With an addiction, there's no control. You can't stop. But yeah. but with with these other things, they were just things that I was really really passionate about and, and enjoyed. And that was the case with online poker. Like I absolutely loved playing online poker right from the start. And even today, you know, it's it's still the thing which probably gives me the most pleasure. Like uh, you mentioned uh, earlier, uh, the the two deep runs last night. Like again, it was just a great feeling, and just ev everything, the world just shrinking down to just those two tables, and that's all you're thinking about, and all, all all of the problems of the world go away, and you're just completely focused for as long as you're in the the competition, uh, or the tournament on that, and that was something I got in running as well. Like I remember the first time I won in New York. Uh, the New York culture, the world just shrank down to what I was doing in that moment. And that was the only thing I had to think about. And it was an amazing feeling. And, you know, essentially a feeling of Zen of like, this yes. is, this, this is what I'm thinking about. And this is what I'm focused on. And it's a really calm state and very happy state to be in. And I, I, I still like get that with online poker. Uh, when I'm playing online poker, all of the, all, all of the problems of the world go away. And that's that. That's all I think about, and I just really enjoy constantly having to make decisions, constantly having to think what's the best thing to do in this situation. Yeah, yeah. You you said the uh, Zen, but also it's a flow state, and I think it's it's yeah. really not not many people can get into the state too. So I think it's really uh, one of the ability to actually get focused on and uh, retain that the uh, focus too. So I think you develop that from running or, you know, doing a strategy games. And I think that's really suit for you then. Yeah. 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 yeah very much. Yeah. And, and, and you mentioned earlier thing, uh, things which uh, predict whether a player can, is going to make it as a poker player. And that's, that's something as well too. You, you do, you do sometimes meet students who start and they're just, 
permanently distracted and they can't okay. ever seem to completely focus on something. And that makes it very difficult. Um, and then you meet other students who, when you're when you're coaching them, they're completely focused on what you're saying and they're thinking about everything. And and even if they're a bit slow at the start, that doesn't matter. Like it doesn't matter how fast you learn something. It's it's it's, it's whether you can learn how deeply you can learn it. And and the players who learn it the most deeply are the ones who can focus the most and really think about it. And then they carry that into their poker as well. When when they are playing poker, they 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 can achieve that 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 state of flow as you as as you described it. Yeah. I think I, I'm 31 and I'm the uh, last generation that I didn't have smartphone when I was growing up. So, yeah, I'm sure that the, nowadays like a new student, see, you know, like Twitch or not Twitch, uh, TikTok, all the social media, their attention span is like so short. And I think that they're quite a disadvantage for those players. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, th I think that general, I mean, that's the way the world works now. You have to be able to sort of like do lots of things at the same time but even within that like young people do come and they still and they have as deep focus as 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 my generation uh would have i think it's you know it, it it varies from person to person some people are just naturally suited to to really short attention span activities but other people it's it, you know it's a bit like running like my, my running coach in the club that i ran for he could look at a six-year-old and say what they were going to be good at, whether they were going to be sprinters or they were going to be distance runners, just by looking at them, just by the sh at the shape of them, uh, mm. uh, or, or whether they were going to be jumpers. And I think it, 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 in a mental capacity, the same is also true. There are some people who are just naturally suited to short bursts, uh, highly frenzied activity. And then there are other people who are better suited to, to long slow things and, and that's what poker is poker is the ultra running of strategy games it's all it's one massive long lifelong session where you are constantly learning you are constantly having to do the same things over and over again you have to be okay with that you have to be okay with the fact that the game fundamentally doesn't change but yet it does change in the sense that all the spots you you're faced with are different are slightly different and you have to keep learning and um, and i think some people that that fits well with their mind the way they the way they think and then there are other people you know they might be very bright people they might be very smart people but they need constant distraction and they need to be doing lots of different things and they're 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 essentially mentally uh, restless yeah. and they're not going to be able to just sit at a poker table and fold for hours and hours and hours waiting waiting, waiting for a good spot uh -huh. and uh what i mentioned like a new new kind of player and also you mentioned the silver era so we have now this great tool called GTO, a solver, Pyro solver, uh, also GTO wizard, which is, you know, library version. You can just access, you know, quite a few seconds and see the solver's solutions. And I am guilty of this mistakes and you probably did for a certain time that wrong way of using solver. And yeah. one thing that I way that I use wrong way is I play hands. And look through the solver solution. Oh, this is bluff catch spot. Oh, this combo is good. And and we've yeah. I've done it so long, and I realize it's this wrong way. And would you agree? And is there anything else that the wrong way of using solvers? Yeah, I yeah I couldn't agree more. And I think almost every player in the world did this the wrong way when when the solvers came out, myself included. Um, I was a very early adopter of the solvers when PO came out. I was using it within a few months. Um. My background was in software anyway, so I was I was comfortable with technology on 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 that level, and I was I was aware of how useful software can be. Um, I I remember at the start there was there was quite a lot of resistance to the solvers. People are saying, well, you know, a computer can't be very good at this. It's like they don't know all the human aspect, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I wasn't one of those people. I was like, you know, no, no, this is definitely the future. Um, uh, we're we're, we're we're getting in there and we're and, and we're using solvers. I was actually listening to a, a chess commentator yesterday say that you know back in the nineties we actually thought humans were good at chess. How stupid were we <laughs> compared, to, compared to computers? The best human is absolutely terrible. And I kind of realized instinctively, I think that the same had to be true of poker. That the the solvers obviously they were rudimentary at the start, but they were but they were going to get better and better, and they were going to be a massive tool. But like you said everybody used it the wrong way you you would play a hand and you didn't know uh whether you played it correctly and before solvers what what would i do i'd ask the five best players i knew i'd describe 
all of the relevant information and I'd ask them what they would do. And often I'd get five different answers and then I had to decide which, which of the five people I trusted the most. When the solvers came along, I sort of got rid of those five people and now I just asked the solver and the solver would say, you played this fine. Or the solver would say, yes, you can call the river 10% of the time. And I'd pat myself on the back and say, it's okay to call, but you know, not really because I was calling hundred percent of the time. And, uh, Almost everybody I know who use solvers, that's the way they use from the start. I think probably the one exception to that um, is Dominic Nietzsche, who from the start was like, this is this is bullshit. This is not the way solvers should be used. You should be just looking at like button versus blind, different stack depths, different position against different position, learn, le learning the overall patterns. And that, and, and that is the correct thing. It's, it, it's not a lookup tool to see if you played a spot correctly, because even if, if you find out that the solve that you that you did, you can pat yourself on the back, but you haven't learned anything. If you find out that you played the spot wrong, well, unless you go and 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 generalize and study that spot in more detail, you know, stack that position and on and, and get a deep understanding. So what you haven't really learned anything either, because that exact situation will almost certainly never come up again. Um, uh, the the correct way to use solvers is to study the the the, the most common spots that come up time and time again. Um, but rather than looking at every combo and go, this is what we do, just just looking for the patterns, like what kind of hands make good value bets? What kind of hands uh, should we play passively as bluff catchers? What kind of hands should we actually turn into bluffs? What are the characteristics of those hands? Why, 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 why does the solver want to bluff 6-3 suited in this spot and it doesn't want to bluff jack-10 off? And when you use that, when you use it essentially as a microscope, to study poker and to put poker under the microscope and try and figure out the concepts, that's when you really can make the most progress. Um, and that's something we we try to get across in, 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 in our book, GTO Poker Simplified. It's not about looking at millions and millions of solutions and trying to, to, to remember them because there are so many flaws in that way of thinking. First of all, you're, you're never going to remember uh, all, all of it correctly. Second of all, the solvers are not... Uh, they're not invincible. They we we had spots where we ran the same spot in two different solvers and got two slightly different outputs, and that's just the case. That's I you know I know from software there's margin of error in everything. There, it it depends on your assumptions. When we brought out GTO Poker Simplified, we had used PO to run all of our solves, and immediately we started getting a message saying, "Oh, the solution in GTO Wizard is slightly different. Your solve must be wrong." It's like they're not. Yes, our solve is wrong, but GTO Wizard is also wrong. They're both slightly wrong. <laughs> uh, uh, so, so, don't, so don't focus on... None of them is written in stone. Uh, focus on what the, the overall solution looks like and trying to work out the strategic principles underlying that rather than what do I do with 6-3 suited in this spot and, and what's, at, at what frequency. Um, I was talking to Andy Black about this recently and I, 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 Andy doesn't use solvers at all, but he said he's detected a new level of, of sort of people going, well, the solver says this, so this, this is, this has to be right. And he thinks a lot of people are sort of misapplying and misunderstanding the solvers. And I said, absolutely they are because what they're doing is they're treating the, the solver as, as, as a Bible where everything in it is absolutely 100% true. And if you do anything else, it's completely wrong. And th this is particularly the case in, in, in the latest generation of solvers. When, when the solvers came on the scene first, like PO solver, et cetera, you had to program everything yourself. You had to tell it what the two ranges were. You had to tell it what bet sizes to consider. You had to, you, you had to do all of this legwork yourself. So because you were doing that, you understood what the solution was when it came back. You understood, well, this is, this is a solution, but it's only a solution based on my assumptions, on my assumptions of what the two ranges are, on my assumptions of what the bet sizes are, but maybe there's another bet size that's better that I didn't put in. But but I don't know about that. Um, so I think people who used PO Solver and the other solvers in the start had had, had a better understanding of, you know, as powerful a, a tool as it was, it still had limitations. It's not, you know, people talk about a solution to a hand. There is no solution to a hand. There's a solution to the parameters that you programmed, to the ranges and the bet sizes you allowed. But it's no limit hold'em. You can use any bet size, and it could very well be the case there's another bet size which would completely change the solution. But the situation, as far as that goes, has gotten worse since the lookup tools like GTO Wizard and Range Trainer Pro, et cetera, have come on the scene. Because now people are just looking at that saying, well, that's the solution. That must be the thing. But they're not 
they're kind of unaware of the fact that well it depends on the ranges that um that those tools are using and it depends on the best sizes that they're that they're using and allowing um and yes they're incredibly powerful training tools um but they sh but they should be seen as training tools not as lookup tools yeah definitely uh i i always tell the people like gto solution is so fragile because as you said it that that GTO Wizard solution is something that every single six players agree to use this, and that would be yeah. the correct answer. So yeah, yeah. If if you change a little bit, and yeah. everything is going to be different. Yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah, we're all going to use exactly these ranges. You know, UTD two is going to open ace ten off forty percent of the time, not fifty percent, not thirty percent, forty percent, and all the players are going to use these ranges, and they're all going to know each other's ranges. And then on the flop, they're only going to use these best sizes. And they're they're all going to play perfectly, and then they're going to go to the turn, and they're going to use these bat sizes. And when we get to the river, we're going to use these bat sizes. Uh, it's a toy game which yeah. represents the overall uh, game tree, but but yeah, it's not poker. It's no. it's as close as you can get to using, and you can you can certainly learn a huge amount from it. Like the 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 solvers had been responsible for more jumps forward in 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 poker theory than anything else. You know, when I started, the books were there and most of them weren't very good. Most people got better at playing poker just by playing poker and then by talking with other players who were good at the game. And then the the, the training video era started uh, with card runners, etc. And now you could watch some of the top players in the world explain their thought process and people got better. But the real jump forward happened when the solvers came and the solvers identified certain things, you know. Uh, the solvers identified that people weren't opening enough of certain types of hands from, from from certain seats. You know, when I started play playing, if you asked any pro what hand should you open under the gun, they would say um, any pair better than pocket eights, um, any two Broadway cards, maybe ace ten suited, ace nine suited, and that's it. Um, you know, the solvers came along and said, "No, no, open all the suited aces. You need to have you need to have board coverage. You need to be able to flop lots of flush draws, lots of flushes, lots of backdoor flush draws." And then, if we go on to the flop, what type of hands do we use as bluffs? Uh, the solvers were like, "Okay, any hand which is sort of a double backdoor, that's a great bluff to have because if you get called, there are lots of good turn cards for you uh, because of because of the fact that it's a double backdoor." Yeah. And these are the these are general principles, and this is this is where the solvers are are are, are really at, at their most useful when they can show us general principles that we can we can then apply in thousands and thousands of different spots rather than what do I do in this exact spot? Yeah, yeah. I I think the uh, GTO the wizard and the lookup solutions are powerful tools, and it's definitely accelerate our uh, evolution of poker, but also create a lot of a uh, copy and paste GTO person, yeah. and that that's definitely uh, dangerous things to do. And also, uh, it it was great. To, uh, I'm going back to your uh, Chip Race podcast, 150th uh, anniversary episode, and congratulations for that. But the I was uh, listening, and uh, there was a section called uh, Blocker Schmucker, you know. And <laughs> I think that's something that the uh, GTO Wizard or Lookup Tools really emphasize because when you look up the solution. And you look up the different hands, and usually why this is fold, why this is call, is blocker effect. But blocker effect is such a small effect. So uh, when I when I explain to the people, I guess you watch football, soccer, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So at the soccer, there's a points and a table, and if the points are the same, maybe it's like a goal differences. Yeah. And if the goal difference is the same, and then it goes there and there that's blockers and then it's not not, not the that's, biggest of blocker that's an absolutely brilliant analogy i've never thought of that but but i, but I really like that because essentially like yeah typically on in, in league tables we use goal difference but that doesn't mean we should that, that we should just be focusing on goal difference yeah. you know if if you're winning a game one nil um and the other team is better than you and there's not too much time to go you should probably be trying to j just keep preserve your your lead and make sure that you get the points yeah. Con conversely, if you're if you're if you're if if you're um, 
you know, four or five nil up, then yeah, maybe you should you should be trying to score more goals for your goal difference. But the goal difference is probably not going to make a huge effect at the end of the se- season. It's only a tiebreaker. And this is a this is a phrase we actually used in, in GTO Poker Simplified. Blockers are tiebreakers. If you reach a spot where you have to call some hands and you have to fold others, um, your bluff catchers, then the only thing you can fall back on is blockers. But they make very little difference. Like if you drill down in the solver and look at a hand that has very good blockers in a in a in a, in a river spot where you're calling a certain amount of your bluff catchers, all that all that will do is it will change your the EV of your bluff catch from. Uh, from from zero, which is what typically a bluff catcher is making, to maybe plus 0.2 of a big blind, it's going to be very close. And if you if if you call a hand that has bad blockers, that's blocking uh, their bluffs and is uh, unblocking their value, then that changes it probably from zero to minus 0.2. Uh, it's a tiny difference, and people people definitely overfocus on it and. You know, whereas if you miss a clear value bet on the river, that could be a 10 big blind mistake. If you make a bad value bet on the river, um, that could be a 10 big blind mistake. So that's really where you should be focusing your study. But, you know, people love the idea of blockers because they're exciting. It's exciting to think about ranges and it's an intellectually challenging exercise. But, but you know, the, the basics are if you have a value hand, you should be, you should, you should be betting it and you should be thinking about what, what, what's, what's the highest EV size. And that makes a much bigger difference to your to your long term uh, gain. And you know, in the, the the next book we have coming out at the end of this month, which is called Beyond GTO, which is looking at exploitative poker, like that makes the point that if you tell the solver somebody is over bluffing, then the solver doesn't care about blockers anymore. It just calls all the bluff catchers okay. because all the bluff catchers are making money. And you know, if the person is over bluffing a lot, all the bluff catchers are making quite a lot of money. So folding anything is a, is is a pretty big mistake in that spot. Similarly, if somebody is under bluffing, which is more often the case in in in, in poker with humans, then none of your bluff catchers are good cat are are, are are good calls. They're all bad. And it doesn't matter how good your 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 blocker is. You might have the best blockers in the world. All that means is instead of losing three big blinds with this call, you're you're only losing two point nine now. Um, you know, it's 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 really not worth. It. Pe- people focus on the wrong things, and you know that that segment you referred to that that was that's an old school player, uh, Barney Boatman. But he but he has an excellent point. Um, it's only where the decision could go either way that you should even consider your blockers. I remember playing a hand against Stevie Chidwick once, and I got to the river with a pure bluff catcher, and. The first thing I didn't think about was my blockers. The first thing I thought about was, do I think it's likely he's over bluffing or under bluffing in this spot based on his perception of me? Um, you know, if he knows who I am, uh, then perhaps he 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 might over bluff, uh, thinking that I'm going to fold a lot in the river. But if he doesn't know who I am and he just sees me as a you know man in his fifties. And men in his in their fifties tend to be quite stubborn on the river, particularly when younger people bet. He might think I'm calling too much, and he might be under bluffing. And I decided that that was actually more likely um, that he that he would he was under bluffing because he thought I would call having called turn and called river. Uh, you know, stubborn old man is going to. Uh, sorry, having called flop and called turn, stubborn old man is likely to call the river as well. So I thought he's actually probably under under bluffing here. So I never got to the point where I thought I was thinking about blockers because I didn't think it mattered. I thought it was. On on a base of probability, far more likely he was under bluffing than than over bluffing. Do you think the that's more important in live poker? How people perceive you more a player player types at the bluffing over bluffing? Yeah, you. I, th- I think in, in in any spot where you have a bluff catcher, that's all you should be thinking about. Really, uh, under under bluffing or over bluffing, and. It depends on so many things. It depends on the player's personality themselves. Some players just love uh, bluffing and, and they're going to over bluff in almost every spot. Most players are naturally cautious. They won't even thin value bet. If somebody doesn't thin value bet, they're probably not going to bluff either because uh, particularly in live poker, because they feel stupid having to show the bluff. Um, uh, but then on certain board textures, you know, if all the draws miss, and they have lots and lots of available bluffs and you know they seem reasonably studied so they know they're supposed to bluff a lot they might have too many bluffs but on the other hand if the board runs out really dry with lots of high cards and you know the solvers to meet to to, to meet um minimum bluff frequency 
are going to start turning under pairs and uh, pseudo connectors that haven't hit the board into bluffs. But humans won't do that. A human won't look at a final board with nothing but high cards and be there with pocket sixes and decide, oh, I need to bluff this. They'll just they'll just check and hope that their hand is good. So there's so much to think about. The, 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 the player themselves, what their natural tendency is, the board itself, does it lend itself to over bluffing or under bluffing? How it's gone for them recently as well. Like, are they frustrated? Are they trying to force the issue? Do they want to absolutely win a hand, which makes it more likely they're, bluff, they're going to bluff? Or is it near the end of the night, and they just want to bag up their chips and come back the next day, and they don't want to lose, uh, lose, lose a, a big pot on a big bluff before. And then they're sizing as well. You know, um, some players typically uh, bet small when they're smallish when they're bluffing, and 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 quite big when they're going for value. Some players do the opposite. So you have to sort of profile all your opponents based on that. And then there's also their perception of you. You know, just because you haven't seen the bluffing yet. When they're playing against the young players, you know, when they're playing against you, they might play differently. When they're playing against a woman, they might play differently. Uh, you know, I, I I coach quite a few female students, and one thing that comes up time and time again is that men try to block women more, uh, oh. uh, because they think they can get them to fold. Um, well, actually, there 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 are two types of men. Uh, as as a really gross generalization, there are there are a lot of men who think women are are, are weak type players and 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 can be pushed around and can be made to fold. So they they bluff more against them than they do against other players. But then there are some men who have the complete opposite uh, idea. They think well, women are tight, cautious players. They always have a hand, so I'm not. I'm, so I'm never going to bluff them. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, when I'm coaching female students to play live, I tell them like just just watch all the men and try and decide which type each guy is. Is he the guy that will try and bluff you at every opportunity, or is he the type of guy that will never bluff you? And the same is true of older players. There there are some young players who will always try to bluff an older player because they think well they're weak and they can get them to fold. And then there are other players who will think. You know, old guys don't fold very much, so I'm I'm just not going to bluff very much against them. Interesting, interesting. And and also, you can kind of player profile based on their outfit too. If the guy's wearing tank top and little, you know, beer on the hand, maybe you know more likely to bluff. But yeah, absolutely. There's there, there's so much information. What they're wearing, even how they stack their chips. Like, oh yeah, if a guy has his chips very very tight, very very neatly stacked, and he doesn't have too many small chips. uh there's information there you know he's probably he's probably on the tighter side he doesn't like doing big splashy belts if a guy has lots and lots of small chips you know he just arrives at the table that probably tells you he plays a lot of hands and he and 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 he probably likes to bluff and as you said a tire is very important too i remember the first year i was playing on the international circuit i was playing in england and there was a very um flamboyant O- older player called Paul Marrow. He he basically dressed like a peacock. He had every color imaginable <laughs> in, in in his outfit, and he tried to pull a really big bluff, and he got called on the river. And he was he was shaking his head. He couldn't believe how his opponent had 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 called him. And the guy beside him turned to him and said, "Mate, if you wanted to try a bluff like that, you probably should dress a little bit more conservatively, um, <laughs> because he 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 just looked like somebody who bluffed." Mm, <laughs> you know, yeah, that yeah. was the reality. Interesting. And so, some players even have that, like, I never bluff or something like that. I'm type player or something yeah, like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's one of, the, uh, one of the things as well. You notice online, like, people sometimes put some sort of strategy, strategic reference into their name. And I always say, like, it's the exact opposite. If they, if their name is I never bluff, they over bluff. If their name is I is bluff a lot, they probably never bluff. If their name is I'm a pro, they're definitely not a pro. <laughs> yeah. To be a pro, and uh, yeah, pro- pros tend to have really boring screen names, and uh, and 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 yeah, you know, if, if if but some people think you know when they sign up and they think, oh well, I like to bluff a lot, so if I change my name to I never bluff, then people will think I'm not bluffing. Um, level one thinking, but uh, mm-hmm. yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's generally not the case, and you, and you can also pick that up from you know when you're playing live from the table talk, um, if people. You know, the classic one is, uh, you know, we're, we're, you're late in a tournament, somebody's trying to hang on to the money um, and they're getting very upset because people are tree betting them a lot and attacking their blinds a lot. And they start talking, next time I three bet, I'm going all in or next time somebody raised my big blind, I'm going all in. And that's never the case. <laughs> if they feel the need to say that, it basically means they're just trying to stop you from raising their blind or tree betting them, but they're actually just desperate to hang on to the money. Whereas if they're staying there quietly saying nothing 
that's the type of player who is more likely to play back at you. Yeah. Or even cash game, right? When they start looking at the you know clock and oh I gotta go soon, goal in and yeah, they got a nuts. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. 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 yeah, there's one player I, I play with and he he does that in tournaments as well. He 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 always has a plane to catch. So he's he's uh <laughs> you know he 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 doesn't really want to be in the tournament. He, in fact he shouldn't be in the tournament because his plane is coming, but 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 when he moves all in, he has it, and people and people fall for it. You know, it it is effective if they if they genuinely buy the idea that the guy has a plane to catch, and then he seems to move all in, and they look down at ace ten and they think, well, he's probably very wide here, and you know, he has aces or ace king uh, every time. Maybe you should bring your girlfriend or wife and just sing right next to you, and just like, hey, we got a dinner to catch, <laughs> and let them use yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, we we talked about the wrong way of using solver and everything, but that you you throughout your career you were focused on tournament majority of your tournament career. Correct. And could you give me a three tournament mistakes that you see all the time, live and uh, online? Yeah, um, I think I I think probably the biggest mistakes I see are ICM mistakes. Um, e e even now ICM is not very well understood by uh by the vast majority of tournament players and it, it it surprises me online because there's uh i see it makes such a huge difference to your bottom line like there are amazingly talented players um but they end up being unsuccessful because they don't understand icm and they just make really big errors at the end of tournaments you can make a very big error at the start of a tournament and it's only going to cost you by definition a fraction of your buy-in like even if somebody shoves all in and they accidentally expose their hand as aces and you call off seven two off obviously that's a horrendous mistake but it's it, but it's only costing you 80 percent of your buy-in um a very a very minor mistake at the end of the of, of a tournament could cost you a, a lot more than that and i have a specific example of that the guy i do the podcast with uh he made a call off about 10 years ago on the final table of a bigger 55 and when he told me the hand he called off, I think it was AS10, I was like, oh, I don't think AS10 is the call there. I think probably AS-Jack is a call, but AS10 feels wrong. And we ran it in a solver. And yeah, AS-Jack was the line, but the but it was a really unforgiving line. Basically, Ace calling AS-Jack off made, let's say, four buy-ins, but calling AS10 off lost 20 buy-ins, uh, which is like, you know, that... It, 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 you see that time and time again. Even even you know one pip mistakes late on in tournaments are very very costly, particularly calling mistakes. Um, and that that's something we focus on in the in the new book as well. Like just how big certain mistakes are. Like shoving mistakes and aggressive mistakes tend not to lose you as much money in the long term. But passive mistakes, calling in the wrong spot, can 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 be can be catastrophic. So that's something I would urge people to focus focus on icm but also also be aware that a calling mistake is likely to be huge uh whereas a folding mistake often isn't like you, when you look at a lot of these icm lines you see that the worst hand that you're supposed to call with only makes you maybe a buy-in or two but calling with the strongest hand that you're supposed to fold loses you 10 or 20 buy-ins so if there's any doubt in your mind, if you think if you're not sure where the line is and you think your hand is either just over the line or just under the line, you're probably better off erring on the side of folding because folding, if it's a mistake, will be a less mis will be a smaller mistake than calling. Uh, that's the that that's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is 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 as great as GTO is, and you know, having written a book on GTO, I'm I, I, I'm obviously an acolyte. People are taking it f way too far these days. People, uh, you know, and we've we've touched on this. People are are treating the 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 the, the lookup tools as bibles, and they think they have to play exactly the way the lookup tool is. But you know, that's based on their assumptions. You know, you you might look up a spot and and the solver says call seventy percent on the river, full thirty percent. By definition, that means it's a break even call, and it could it, it it might be a terrible call in practice because the guy might be under bluffing. Um, so. Uh, yeah, like anytime you look up a hand, if you are going to look up hands, don't just look at the at the results, what you were supposed to do. Look at the EV as well. And, and look at the assumptions. Look at the hands the, the player is supposed to be bluffing with and ask yourself, are they actually bluffing with these hands? Are they finding all these bluffs in this spot? 
um, and, 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 and look at the thinnest value bets as well. Are they actually value betting all of these hands thin? Because if they're not value betting as much, uh, and uh, but but they're not bluffing at all, uh, then you know cer certain hands become terrible calls. Uh, that's that's the second thing I would say. The third thing I would say, and th and this is probably the hardest because it's 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 hardwired into us. But you do see players who play really really well up to a certain point, and then for whatever reason, maybe they lose a flip or they take a bad beat, or they're just tired, or they're dissatisfied with their stack. Um, you know, they, they, they played well all day, but nothing has happened for them, and they withered down. And then they just make a really big mistake. And poker is a game that punishes a mistake rather than rewards good play. Uh, you can play perfectly and not win. You can play... You, you, uh, but, but, uh, but one mistake will, 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 will cost you everything. And... That's kind of the way to, to think of it. You know, if you think of a sporting analogy, um, you have sports like golf, for example. You can go out and get a get a hole in one, a hole, a hole in one at the first hole. You haven't won the tour, the, the tournament, or or anywhere close to it. It's just giving you a slight advantage. You now have to play seventy one other holes, and then at the end of that, we'll see who wins. It's a it, it's a cumulative thing. Then you have other sports like long jumping, where you can all of your early long jumps can be terrible and you can be nowhere and then you come on, on your last long jump and you absolutely ace a jump farther than anybody else and guess what now you've won the competition well poker is golf poker is not long jumping uh you you have to focus on every single hand playing it as well as you possibly can and if you do that, your results will be much better rather than trying to be brilliant in, in, in any particular spot and, and, and finding brilliancies. You know, what we call fancy play syndrome. I see a lot of players have this. They want to make a brilliant call or a brilliant fold. Um, I, I remember talking to a young Irish player who, who doesn't really play anymore early on in his career. And I told him that if I shoved all in on a board, on a final board that ran, that ran, that, that, that read ace, ace, king king three you would be more likely to call me with pocket sixes than with king queen because you're looking for you're looking for brilliancies mm. you're 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 looking for you're looking to either make a brilliant fold or a brilliant call and uh you know that's not the way poker works poker is just about avoiding uh making really big mistakes at, at, at least in my mind a big mistake as i said particularly when you're a tournament player can cost you the entire tournament. Um, whereas, you know, playing a hundred hands brilliantly, you know, yeah, that's great, but it's not going to win you the tournament. I like the analogy that you compared to golf and the golf is, you know, you, 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 you kind of playing against yourself in the mental sports and also you're playing with environment and the poker is you're playing against the variance, which is the environment. So yeah, 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 absolutely. If you think about it, like poker, you really, you are, you are really just playing against yourself to a, to a large extent because you can't control the cards. You can't control what other players are going to do. But but you have to take all of that information into account and come to your own decisions. And if you make perfect decisions, you will win in the long term. You won't necessarily win in the short term. In tournaments, you're going to get it in flipping a lot. You're going to get coolered a lot. You're going to be on the right side of coolers, wrong side of coolers. And one of the things which makes poker difficult is that, is the feedback is so bad. Yeah. You can play brilliantly and lose. And in fact, that will happen most of the time in tournaments. When you play brilliantly or you, you you can play absolutely horrendously or see somebody else play really really badly but get very lucky yeah. and win the tournament and you know this is this is why bad players often stay bad because they they focus on the wrong thing they say the, they see the guy playing badly and they see him win the tournament and think well oh that's the way i should play i saw i saw him raise seven four off under the gun and he and he flopped a house and he's he stacked another guy so now i'm going to start playing seven four off under the gun um and then the opposite can happen too. I've seen players who start out from a very good um, strategy point where they have their ranges down and tight, but then as soon as things start going wrong, the game just slips. They start playing hands they shouldn't. Uh, over the long term, their their strategy changes. Uh, it can change in either direction. They can either become too loose because they're think they're seeing other players being, in their mind, rewarded for for being too loose. Or they get too tight and cautious, and they're and and they're afraid to take um, the close spots that you that that you have to take. Sometimes, uh, it's you know it's uh, I think Mike Tyson 
talking about boxing once said that everybody has a, a everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you know, then their brain is scrambled. Well, poker punches you in the face all the time. Yeah. You 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 do the right thing, you get rivered, you get two outed on the river. You have to you have to deal with that emotionally. Um, you have to just move on and say, okay, well, I made the right decision. I just got unlucky. That's part of the game. It's actually a vital part of the game. If that wasn't in the game, uh, players wouldn't play badly um, for money, at least. You know, nobody ever, no, no, no mediocre chess player will ever challenge Magnus Carlsen no. to a chess game for lots of money because he knows he's going to lose every time. Um, but in poker, the fact that, that 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 there is this variance element, which allows bad players to win over a small sample, that's what keeps the game alive. Yeah, uh, that's the definitely. I I completely agree. And I would like to uh, move on to the mental game aspect. But before, could you please take your lovely Japanese version of the the uh, book? <laughs> Because uh, all the three things that, that you mentioned, it's probably. In the book, uh, Poker Satellite Ascendant, which is a uh, poker satellite strategy, a first book that you wrote. This yeah. was the very first book I wrote, yeah. Um, basically, um, yeah, I, I, I had sort of in the back of my mind that I would like to write a book at some time, but I never really got around to it. And then Barry Carter, who had written The Mental Game of Poker uh, with Jared Tender, he had written a piece uh, for poker strategy. I think it was called something like the 10 poker books that were never written, but should have been. And one of them was satellites. And uh, a few years later, I think he, he reviewed that and he, and he was still surprised that nobody had written a book on satellites. Um, so at the time I was generally considered to be the best online satellite player in the world. I, I mainly played satellites. Um, because back then it was a very good time for satellites online. Uh, you know, you could play them on stars you could qualify for the same tournament 20 times and you got T dollars for, yeah. uh, for, for, for the last 19 of those. So it, 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 it was very lucrative. A, a lot of regs, a lot of pros just didn't play satellites. It was a kind of a snobbish attitude. Satellites are not real tournaments. Even the pros who played them, played them quite badly. They play them like normal tournaments. Yeah. Um, I, I put a lot of time and thought and work into affecting the strategy. So I was genuinely, um, I, I, I had a fairly massive edge in satellites. So Barry came to me and was like, would you be interested in writing a book about satellites? And uh, for a couple of reasons, one of the reasons why I'd always held back is I had trained people to play satellites um, and found that the more people I trained, the, the harder those satellites became for me. <laughs> um, I remember once, probably the biggest mistake I made in my career was Uh, two very good online regs paid me $1,000 for one hour's coaching on satellites. And I thought, oh, that's amazing. I can make $1,000 in an hour. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely do that. Um, and I taught them all the most important stuff about satellites. And they both ran stables at the time. Oh. So suddenly there were 60 really good players in my, in my satellites. Um, and I lost far more than $1,000 in EV because of that. Um, so that was one of the reasons why I, I, I always held back. But At the time Barry came to me, um, a couple of things had changed. Star, stars moved away from the T-dollar um, system. Now they were only allowing you to qualify for tournaments once. And if you didn't want to play the live tournament, that means there was no point in playing the satellite. But even if you were did want to play the live tournament, it meant as soon as you won your first satellite, that's it, you were done. Yeah. So satellites weren't lucrative as lucrative anymore. So I had kind of moved away from satellites when I was mainly playing regular tournaments now. And... So so the idea of writing a book was less unattractive, let's say, um, because, you know, when I wrote the book, the most common reaction I got from my friends who are pros were like, why on earth did you put everything into the book? Why did you explain everything? That's not what you're supposed to do in a book. You're just supposed to give people a small amount of information that will help them, but keep the rest of the secrets back so, so we can go on. But I... You know, I can't do that. If I'm <laughs> going to write a book, I want to make the book as good as it possibly can be. And I want people to go, wow, this is an amazing book. So I put absolutely everything I knew. All, well, not everything I knew, but all the really important stuff. Otherwise, if I put everything I knew, the book would have been a thousand pages long. But I put all the most important stuff in. Um, and that was that, that was crucially like, you know, I said at the start, I've always been a very competitive person. So if I do something, I don't want to half-ass it. I don't want to just do it for the sake of doing it. I want to do it as 
as well as I possibly can. So for that book, there was a lot of thought went into what needs to be set, what needs to be put in. We we can't write a thousand page book. Nobody will read it. We need to work out what are the most important things, but also what's the most important order to teach people. It's um because you know I know from experience on my bookshelves behind I have lots and lots of poker books. <laughs> Very few of those I got to the end. Uh, all of them I started, and at some point I was like, okay, I don't really want to read the rest of this book. I I, I have I found this other book that I'm more interested in. So. I remember saying to Barry, most people don't read books till the end. So what we're going to do is we're going to front load it, all the most important information at the start, so that if they bail after one chapter, at least they got the most important 10% of what's in the book. If they bail after two chapters, 20%, et cetera. So we did the book in, in, in quite a strange structure. In in satellites, the most important bit is the, is the bit at the end. Bubbles. Yep. Um, how, how you play around bubbles. Not, not, not how you play the start, because the start plays reasonably like a normal tournament there are some things but you know so the the logical way i think in a lot of people's mind to do the book would be talk about how you play the start of a satellite at the start of the book then how you play the middle and then how you play the end but i thought well if we do that people won't get to the end which is the really important bit so we moved the end right back and we said okay we're going to start at the end and that way people will will get the most important thing and but i think and uh, th there was another uh there was another uh, unforeseen consequence of that. I think a lot of people, when they read the book, because the most important stuff is at the start and it's genuinely mind blowing stuff because satellite strategy is so different from normal strategy that it's actually super interesting. Uh, and and so, so a lot of people said to me, you know, I started reading the book and I thought it'd be quite boring, but the first few chapters really gripped me because, you know, you were, you were, you were showing spots where, a player should shove any two cards and other spots where a player should should fold aces and uh this this was mind-blowing so that, that that kind of drew them in and they got to the end of the book and lots of people told me not only did they read the book once but they read it several times um which you know not my experience of the way people consume poker books but but it was very important to me to make the book as good as as good as it could possibly be um uh, and something which would genuinely provide value to readers and the best thing about writing the book has definitely been the number of people who've told me that it's completely revolutionized how they play satellites and even how they think about poker in general because you know what makes satellites different is just a deep understanding of icm yeah. and uh you know uh, tom parsons one of the top irish players told me that he read satellite strategy but actually he got lots of, out of it from how to play in normal tournaments around bubbles or late on when, when icm is quite big and yeah, but the number of people who have said that they've been able to qualify for big tournaments because of the book or, you know, that they do very well in online satellites now and it's basically changed them from losing players into winning players. That's the most rewarding thing. I I, I never really wanted to write a book that was that just kind of went through the motions and, you know, said a few words that might help them a little, but 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 not a lot, which I think unfortunately is the case with a lot of poker books yeah most of the poker books i've read they all have something good in them but 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 it feels like the author is often just giving away the the bare minimum yeah i'm i'm glad in in a poker world should appreciate someone like you actually putting in the everything into the book because you know as you said in the poker book author or even coach coaches you know they don't really put everything they don't really think about their students and you know, are just thinking about the dollar amount so you know hats off to you and uh that is the first book and i'm making sure that i'm gonna put the uh, second one uh i think the end game poker strategy uh book is which is currently number one and the japanese amazon which is great and yeah can you talk about that a little bit please yeah, that's I, I, you. It was you who told me it was number one in, in Amazon, and I'm absolutely delighted to hear that. Um, that was actually the third book we wrote in English uh, after um, Satellite. We we wrote a book in PKOs, uh, Progressive Knockouts, and the reason we wrote that book is it's kind of kind of the opposite to Satellites. In in Satellites, there are lots of spots where you just play really really tight because it's the bubble, but in Progressive Knockouts, you play very very loose. And I was at the time transitioning to playing mostly knockouts. So, so we wrote a book on knockouts and then we wrote uh, the for the third book, we were trying to decide what to write. And the way we, we we come up with this concept of what we call an ICM dial, 
which is if you play a normal tournament, ICM is important. If you play a satellite, ICM is even more important. So you, if you think of it as a dial, you have you, you turn up the dial, and ICM is now super important uh, because of uh, because it's a satellite. But if you're playing a progressive knockout, which is the second book, as I said, we wrote, ICM is less important because half of the pool is in bounties. So you're trying to knock people out, not just ladder up spots uh, in the prize pool. So the ICM dial moves the other way. You move it down. And then we thought, well, both of our books kind of have this underlying theme of like, think about how, how important ICM is. Maybe we should write a book on explaining ICM itself as a concept and why it's so important. And I said to you earlier that the biggest mistake I see people make are ICM mistakes. And I think the reason for that is when I started as an online player, well, for the first year I played limit cash. That's the only time in my period I played a lot of cash because that was the main thing that was online at the time. Mm. But then I transitioned to sit and goes, one table tournaments uh, with six players, two paid, or 10 players, three paid. And in those two tournaments, ICM is super important. You really have to understand ICM to make money. You're playing the same tournament over and over again. You're playing hundreds if not thousands of these every month and the same spots come up over and over again and just having a basic understanding of icm is what makes the difference between being a winning player and a losing player so typically that's how um online players started at the time they would start playing sit and goes because they were a very good way a very good low variance way to grind up a bankroll um and then when they had a when they built up a bankroll, they'd move on to multi-table tournaments, MTTs. And they would take that ICM knowledge that they had built from sit and goes into MTTs. So that generation of, of online poker players, of, of which I am one, understood ICM very well. But somewhere around 2010, 2011, things changed. Sit and goes became more or less pointless. The game, the, they, they were perfectly solved. There were so many people playing them well. The edges just weren't big enough and people couldn't make enough money in them to make it worth their while to grind them. So the next generation of players which started <clears throat> pretty much never played sit and goes. They just moved straight into MTTs. And in MTTs, for most of, for, 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 for most of a multi-table tournament, let's say with 2,000 runners on Stars or GG or wherever, ICM is not that important. It, it doesn't really matter at the start. It gets important around the bubble. Then the bubble bursts. It's less important now. And then th then it only becomes important again, the last two tables, let's say. Um, and, you know, if, if a guy is playing 2,000 runner fields, he's probably only going to cash 16% of the time. So, you know, 80% of the time, uh, ICM doesn't really change the strategy of, of of his decisions. He's not getting deep all that often. He's not making final tables. So they just don't get, an, that generation just didn't get enough practice of ICM. And they just learned to play in a certain way, which was plus cheap EV, but wasn't plus dollar EV. And they, and they were quite bad on ICM. And it surprised me uh, when, when we wrote the book, just seeing, you know, guys who were very good at poker and, you know, played played really good chip EV poker, but they were making fairly big ICM mistakes. Um, and in some ways, the, the the software had moved things that way as well, because most of the early solvers, especially the post-flop ones, um, like PO, didn't do ICM. They just did chip EV. So people were studying these chip EV solutions and thinking, and, and that's how they were learning to play, but they were never taking ICM into account. Tools like Snapshot as well were telling you like which hands to show for 12 big blinds. But, you know, those of us who started in sit and goes knew that that always depended on how near to the bubble we were, what the other stacks were, what the exact payout structure was, et cetera, et cetera. But Snapshot was just saying, no, these are the hands you show. And so, so a lot of ICM mistakes were being made. So, and as I said, I genuinely believe that understanding ICM is the thing which will make the biggest difference to your, to your bottom line. Um, so it seemed like a, a good idea to write a book on this, explaining why it's important, because you do have to explain to people why it's important and um, and when it's important. That that it's most people understand that it's super important around bubbles, yeah. um, particularly if they're short stacked. That just getting into the money is quite important. But even around that, there's a lot of misunderstanding. You know, people think 
people often think if they have a big stack that their ICM is more extreme around the bubble because it would be an absolute disaster to bubble the tournament in which you had a big stack. Whereas the reality is when you're short stacked, yes, it's very important to try and get into the money. But when you have a big stack, it's less important because the main cash is not really what you're aiming for with a big stack. And you shouldn't be afraid of confrontations if they greatly increase your equity and greatly increase your chances of winning um, or at least going deep in the tournament. But people often didn't understand. There were huge misconceptions about ICM late on in tournaments. The biggest of which was, it depends on the pay jump. Uh, like I often heard students saying, you know, they come to me with a hand and I'd say, oh, it's the start of the final table. Like you should have folded that hand because of ICM. And they'd say like, why is ICM important? The next pay jump wasn't big. The, the big pay jumps were like, third to second and second to first and we're miles from that but again that's not that's not how icm works it doesn't depend on the next pay jump um so th in the book we wanted to explain icm why it's important when it's important and how it changes the strategy in general um and that seemed like a really important book to write and when i was uh, i was in vegas at this uh in december for the wpt world championship and a lot of younger players came up to me and, and said, we've read all your books. And to, to to my surprise, the one I think I got the most out of was the ICM book, because it was stuff I hadn't really thought about. Um, but since I read the book and now I understand it and, and I'm hopefully starting to implement and think about ICM, my results in, in tournaments have improved massively. And that's why I think it's such an important book. Um, uh, you know, I still love the satellite book because it was the first book we wrote and made it as good as it could possibly be. And, you know, it was very well received. But I think in terms, if you're a tournament player, I think the book that could make the biggest difference to you is our ICM book. Um, because over my career, I've made a lot of money playing online. Most of that is down to just the fact that I understand ICM pretty well. Um, and I don't really make big ICM mistakes. Um, there are there are thousands and thousands of players who are better at me in almost every other aspect of the game. Um, but there aren't thousands and thousands of players who are better than me at ICM. And a lot of those players who are better at me in maybe every other aspect of the game, they haven't been as profitable as me um, over their career um, because uh, their lack of ICM understanding has really hurt them. Well, that's so much information. I'm sure that you... You probably could wrote like two thousand pages, but you know, nice concise way, and no wonder why it's number one in Amazon right now. And the uh, ICM book is definitely the one to get. And also, uh, I wanted to show you. Uh, this is the your you know friends Barry Carter, um, the uh, mental game second is in Japanese yeah. too. So I, I think this one is also great. But uh, yeah, we uh, actually you know, hour and 40 minutes, and I don't want to keep you like really long. So we're running, wrapping to audience questions now. And which is, I wanted to ask you that the, uh, how to keep your A game or good mental states when things are not going your way. And you know, as you said, how to, you know, variance hits you or the, the certain, certain spots and how to keep that, the mental game yeah. aspect. Yeah, that's a, that, that's a really good question. And like, we're all human. Um, so like, while, while I think that is one of the, the stronger aspects of my game, and I think it's come from the other things that I've done in my life, um, you know, in, 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 in chess, it's important to maintain um, emotional stability as well. In bridge, it is. And in running, it's very important to, you know, even as even as you're starting to suffer and feel really tired and your toenails start falling off in the middle of a 24 hour race or whatever, to be able to keep going. Um so I, I I think I have a lot a lot of that naturally. But what I what what I try to I I've definitely found it easier as I've gotten older, um, because I can focus I can zoom out and just focus on the big picture. Mm -hmm. And you know if I take a horrendous beat in a tournament, uh, and obviously like everybody else, I'm going to feel bad about it. But I just kind of zoom out and think like when I look back at my career, I probably won't even remember this. It'll make almost no difference if 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 you think of my career as as you know a shark scope graph. When you when you zoom in on any small part, there's like a there can be a sharp line down, yeah. or a sharp line up. But when you look at the whole thing, so long as it keeps moving in this direction, that's that that that's the crucial thing. And a, a, any one of those small little zigs up or zigs down, which is all any one tournament is, um, is not going to make much difference. And 
what makes me long-term winning and long-term profitable is that ability to focus on the long-term and try, just, just zoom out from the short-term, realize that variance is a thing, it happens. It's actually a vital part of the game. It's why weaker players will play for money. And 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 and, and there's no point in getting upset about it. Um, uh, but yeah, it's it's still difficult to do in the moment. Yeah. And you know, my my friends know after I bust particularly a big tournament, uh, just don't talk to me for twelve minutes because I am not in a good place. Mm. If you say something to me, I'm probably not going to be very friendly. Um, I just need twelve minutes to sort of like clear my mind out and move on. Um, I definitely tilt after I bust tournaments, but I never tilt before I bust a tournament because, mm. you know, I'm still in the tournament and I'm focusing on the long term. And um, I think that's the thing. It's basically just zoom out. Great, great. Another thing is, uh, I think it's uh, correlated to the mental state and then when you're in the z- z- zone too. And then when you uh, join a big live tournament and because it's more expensive, and also less often it runs compared to the online. So the people tend to uh, refrain from making big bluffs. And what yeah. can you do that to uh, overcome that? Yeah, I, I, I think the, 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 the important mindset to approach a tournament with is, is to recognize that as soon as you have entered the tournament, as soon as you have paid your entry fee, that money is gone uh it's not it's 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 not money you have anymore you 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 have entry in a tournament now and you just have to make the most of that and in the long term you will do best if you just completely forget about the money and just focus on doing as what well, make, making each decision as well as possible and the worst thing you can do is sit there and at the table and think this is a really big tournament and i don't want to go out on a bluff so i'm not going to bluff or conversely this is a really small tournament. I don't care about it too much. So I'm just going to go for all of these bluffs that I wouldn't normally go for if I was taking this seriously. Um, my, my friends have commented uh, when they watch me play that I don't seem to be able to just relax and have fun in a small tournament. Yeah. Um, and by that, they mean, you know, splash around and make lots of bluffs. And, that, and, and that's undoubtedly true. As soon as I sit down, I forget about the buy-in. It doesn't matter anymore. The money is gone. Um, I'm just thinking about what's the best strategy in this spot. What, what am I supposed to do? And that's kind of the mental mindset you have to go in with. the The money is gone. You're not. It's it's not a thing anymore. Now you're in a tournament. You have to do the best things you can possibly do uh, to give yourself the best chance of making the most money in the in the tournament. And if that means going all in and on, on a bluff because it's a pot sized shove on the river and you think the guy is going to fall three fall three quarters of the time. You have to do it, even though it means 25% of the time he's going to call and you're going to stand up and be walking away feeling feeling sorry for yourself, thinking maybe you shouldn't have done that bluff. But I, I think it's also important to be aware of your own mental flaws and cognitive biases. Like the human mind is an absolute minefield of cognitive biases. Yeah. Um, the, the, the most important book I've read for poker outside of poker is Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, where he he, he literally lists all the human biases, uh, cognitive biases we have. And you see them time and time again in poker. So sometimes I'll be in a poker game and I'll feel myself thinking, oh, I want to fold here because I don't want to bust or whatever. And, and, and I have to catch myself and say like, okay, that's just a human cognitive bias uh, creeping in now. Just step back, think about the situation. If this was a one of your regular online tournaments, based on the information you have, what would you do? And then do that rather than being scared of busting. Um, you know, uh, in life in general, if 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 you go through life trying to avoid risk and uh, and suffering and pain you're it's it's got it's 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 not going to be a life well lived yeah. you have to embrace the fact that all of the risk of failure is very important if you uh you know the, the most successful people probably fail more than anybody else because they try lots of different things they fail a lot of the time but they eventually find something that they're successful at and you know same same is true in general as you go through life if you if you're just focused on death all the time and think i'm going to die someday and i want that to be as late as possible um that's not that's no way to go through life that 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 death is part of life uh losing is part of poker failure is part of everything you do you have to embrace that but 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 at the same time do everything you can 
uh, to maximize what you're doing, whether it's playing a game, living your life, um, or any business activity. Well, amazing advice. I can't, I can't thank enough for that advice. It's just such a golden nugget. And you're about to finish your uh, latest book, Beyond GTO. And it's maybe a little too early to ask this, but what is what would be the next one? That would be that's the audience question after this book. Yeah, we have we we have a number of other topics we've thought about writing. Um, one is a follow up to the ICM book, um, because. When we wrote the ICM book, the post-op solvers weren't yet ICM aware. Um, you couldn't you couldn't run spots for, or sorry, they had just become ICM aware. PO, PO solver was the first one. So we, so 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 there there was a rather large chapter uh, in the book where we talked about post-op ICM because up to that point when people talked about ICM, they generally just talked about pre-flop. You know, somebody shoves for fourteen big blinds. What hands should they be shoving because of ICM? What hands should everybody else be calling? Um, because that was the only thing we had exact information on. But PO, as we were finishing that book up, became ICM aware. So we kind of held the book back and we ran some ICMs, lots of ICM sims, and we got sort of the major strategic concepts we could pull out of that. Like when 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 you cover the other player, you get to be far more aggressive in in, in these ways. When ICM is massive between two players, bet sizes go down. When I say is massive between two players, they play their both of them play their ranges more passively. When you're the covered player and the other guy's putting pressure on you, you should bluff catch even very strong hands. Um, that's how you protect your range, etc. So we we identified lots of key principles, but we kind of understood that we were really only um uh sort of scratching the surface, that there was a lot more to this. But you know, we it's quite um cumbersome to run ICM sims. Uh, in PO. So we ran, you know, we ran hundreds of them and then we were like, okay, well, this book could take 10 years to finish if we yeah. if we keep doing this. So so we felt like we'd identified a lot of the most important points anyway. So we put those into the book, but we always had the idea that we're going to have to come back at some stage and do a much more comprehensive book, specifically on post-flop ICM. Yeah. Because I think pre-flop ICM is reasonably well understood now. The, the pre-flop tools like Corbin Resources Calculator uh, they, they they do good on ICMIs or they do good jobs in those spots. But I think post-op ICM is still really not very well understood. And it's something which I I believe the solvers are, are, are going to teach us a lot of stuff that we didn't know. I think you already see that in the high rollers. High rollers already, when you see them play, they play very differently from the way most players play mm. um, post-flop in ICM extreme situations. So that's one book we definitely want to do. Now, the reason why we've delayed that is we've been told that the um, the, the, the lookup tools like GTO Wizard, they're going to have lots and lots of post-flop ICM sims at mm. some future point. So that would greatly speed our process of writing the book rather than having to run all the sims ourselves. Um, but if if that hits the market soon, which we're hoping it will, um, then we'll definitely start uh, tackling our, our post lot by same book. We have another idea too, but Barry doesn't want me to say it um, okay. because it's something nobody has ever written on really prop fully, Ooh. and he's and and we do think it's probably the last big frontier. It's the thing which will make the, the most difference to players' win rates, um, particularly live. Um, but we don't want to announce it and then spend a year writing it and find that somebody gets a book out in six months. <laughs> I guess uh, how to watch out for the outfit and kind of thing, you know, just uh, how, yeah. how people stack the chips. <laughs> exactly, yeah. yeah, 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 maybe. Closed, closed tails. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 could be, could be. Uh, you don't know which uh, which book is going to be uh, translated to Japanese next? Uh, I don't. I, su I suspect GTO Simpl Poker Simplified might be the next one. Um uh, but, but, but Barry keeps much better tabs on these stuffs than I do. I'm absolutely thrilled that the books are being uh, translated into Japanese yep. um, and, and, and other languages too, obviously. Um, I, I think in terms, like, PKO is quite a niche book. You know, it only applies to a specific format, which is pretty much only played online. So I can kind of understand why they jump from Poker Satellite, which was a strategy, which was our first book, to end game ICM. The fourth book we wrote in English um, was GTO Poker Simplified. In many ways, I think for players who are starting, 
that's probably the most important book we've written because that's the conceptual framework of GTO explained. Now, originally, there was no intention of writing a GTO book because there are some really good GTO books out there. Um, Michael Acevedo's Modern Poker Theory is brilliant. Uh, Andrew Brokos's two books on, on game theory, Play Optimal Poker 1 and 2, are both brilliant. And when people ask me about GTO, I would generally just recommend those books to them. But what I found, with particularly with beginning students, was I would tell them read those books and they'd come back and say, yeah, I mean, I can see the books are good, but to be honest, I didn't understand a lot of it. Yeah. Something something more broad, more introductory is needed. So when we wrote GTO Poker Simplified, as the title implies, the idea was that this should be the first book you should read about GTO. This, this will teach you enough that you can then go off and either start using the GTO tools like GTO Wizard uh, yourself, or you can read other books like, uh, like Acevedo and Brokos's excellent books on the subject. Amazing, amazing. And next 10 days, based on your post that you're going to finish up your book, uh, take some rest and uh, take care of your fitness. But what's the beyond? What's your 2024? Any plan, project, anything coming up? Yeah, I I, I always think of my, I don't think in terms of years, I always think, think in terms of six months, because the, the, the WSOP is such a huge thing. It's, it's like the high point of the year. Um, that the first half of the year, I'm always just thinking about getting to Vegas in the best possible shape, what I'm going to play at the WSOP, how I'm going to prepare for it. Um, and that's kind of my major focus. So uh, similar to when I was a runner, w w when you're a runner, you know what your next major race will be. And everything is geared towards preparing for that. You run other races, but they're, but, but they're just as, pre as preparation. I will, I'll, I'll play other live tournaments but really the main focus is just the WSOP and, and getting there in as, in as good a shape physically and in terms of my game. So for the next six months, I'll play a certain amount, of, of a, a decent amount of live, mostly in Ireland because um, I don't enjoy traveling as much as I used to. Um, and there's so much live poker in Ireland now that I don't need to travel as much as I used to if I want to play live poker. My, my ideal, I think, I've always said this from the start of my career, my ideal is to play one week of live every month um or you know maybe five days go to a festival play five days when i when i am playing live i play absolutely everything you know i play all the side events and play as much as i can it's a it's a sort of a short sharp burst um but i couldn't do that all the time i couldn't be the kind of guy who just goes from live tournament to live tournament um i i i'd burn out pretty quickly uh, as i said i still prefer online poker so I'll play as much on and I'll play as much live as I need to, I think, get my live game as sharp as possible for Vegas. I it'll be very it'll be front loaded. I'll play a lot up until Easter when we have the Irish Open. And then between then and Vegas, I won't play very much. I'll mostly be just preparing for Vegas. I'll 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 be using online primarily as a way of just keeping my game sharp as well. Um and then once I come back from Vegas, depending on how it went, obviously, uh, that will then determine what the next six months will be. You know, when I had when when I've had very bad Vegases, and most of them have been bad Vegases, that's just the nature of when you play two thousand runner fields. Um, you know, you come back and you re, you, you regroup, um, and you decide what's the best way to recover from that experience, so that I I I I'll, I'll feel good about going next year. When I've had a very good Vegas, you know, I had a very good Vegas in 2015. I came back and I was absolutely buzzing and I wanted to play more live poker. So I played all the EPTs and I played lots, lot, lots of bigger stuff than I would normally play. So that's why I never planned the second six months before Vegas, because it really does kind of depend on how Vegas goes and how I feel after it. More, more importantly, if I feel energized and I want to go out, get out there and play a lot more, or if I want to go back into a period of reflection, study more, um, maybe work on the content more. Um, um, yeah, so every, everything at the moment is targeted on WSOP. Yeah, I, I can have a, imagine that you have a really bad WSOP and coming back and just running, sprinting hills of in a raining and just like, right? maybe. Yeah, it's, it's funny, like, uh, it's, yeah, like, I've uh, you know, I came back from 2015, as I said, I was absolutely buzzing. I've come back from other Vegas as where I've had a very bad Vegas and, you do need a recovery period. I remember there was one year, I can't remember which year it was, but there was one year where almost as soon as I came back, I had to go to a fairly small tournament in Manchester um, for one of my sponsors. Mm. And I was at the table. I mean, you know, I, I really didn't want to be there. I was very tired. I was very demotivated. Yeah. 
And somebody at the table asked me, when did you get back from Vegas? And I, I thought about it and I, I thought about it for about five minutes. And I, I, I genuinely didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know whether I was back two days or 10 days. It, everything was just a blur. That's how that's how devastated I was after that particular Vegas experience. So I kind of know I'm not going to make any plans past Vegas because mm. it really depends on how Vegas goes, how the WSP goes. Uh, things have changed slightly in the last two years now because there is there is this second major target of the WPT World Championship in the win in December, mm. which I've gone to for the last two years. And uh, I guess I'll always be aiming for that. So, you know, when I was a marathon runner, Ironically enough, I, I just aimed at one big marathon every year, usually the Dublin Marathon. And that was my focus for the whole year. But when I moved into ultra running, I ran, I, I had more than one big race every year. I So I had a number of targets. I think the same is kind of happening in poker now. First half of the year, all about getting to WSP in as good a shape as possible. Second half of the year, all about getting to the win for the WPT World Championship uh, in December in, in as good shape as possible. Amazing. You know, I'm looking forward to see your, what, what's up in the 2024. And if audience wants to see what Slow Doak is doing, maybe they should check out uh, Daryl Kearney on the X, I think. it's the, That's the best way. Yeah, yeah. X, yeah, yeah. Which I, I'm still getting used to calling it X. I know. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, that, that's always kind of been the central hub. Um, I, 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 everything I do, whether it's books, write a strategy article, write a blog, uh, do a podcast like this when it comes out um win a tournament or go deep in a tournament I, i i tend to put something up on twitter i i don't really use twitter in any other way except just to sort of let people know what i'm doing um i have uh put more time into instagram in the last uh couple of years as well uh, essentially instagram for me i i kind of use it as a daily diary um rather than anything else I, i i just on my stories on instagram if i'm deep in a journal i put that up if i'm interviewing somebody for the chip race i put that up so if people just want the big picture uh go on x slash twitter for, formerly known as twitter um and if they want the the the, the really boring detail of what i'm do, up to every day um go on instagram my my chip race co-host says he uses instagram just to see what i'm doing at the moment uh <laughs> in case uh he wants to uh you know bother me about something or 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 try to call me um because most of the time he tries to call me I don't answer um because I'm doing something else like this um and then he'll look on my Instagram and see oh okay he's he that's what he's doing that's why he's not answering <laughs> interesting it's like a spy camera right? <laughs> and also you have the podcast and YouTube channel and you're hosting that chip race and also uh with your friend uh the Barry Cotter uh GTO for normies with Barry and Dara and if you want to check it out that's on YouTube as well Yeah, we do a lot of videos, free strategy videos for that. I think it's important to do free stuff for people as well. Um, obviously, we we charge for the books and I charge uh, if people want to, to be coached by me, I charge as well. I don't do that for free. But I, but I do like giving free content out. I think it's really important to try and keep popularizing the game and keep uh, keep helping people who want to improve to improve. I think the game is very frustrating for people if they want to get better and they can't get better at it. Um, so providing ways for them to get better is is super important. Um One of the nice things about the satellite book is, you know, satellites were kind of dying, which is one of the reasons why I wrote the book. But actually, they've made a comeback since the book came out because yeah. the reason why they were dying is recreation stopped playing them because they recognized that they were outclassed and they were just losing. Um, but, you know, the book came out, they, they learned all the most important secrets and they started playing satellites again. And, uh, and that's important to the game. The game can never be the case that a very small minority have a huge advantage strategically over the rest because the rest will then stop playing, you know, then we become chess. Um, so it's important to keep putting out information so that people at least have a fighting chance yeah. and feel that it's, uh, that, that they're, that, that they're not just being outclassed. So that's why we put out as much free strategy content we as we can we also do uh, strategy on the chip race we we have strategy segment every uh every show the latest one we put out we had an amazing piece by jason coon uh one of the best strategic thinkers in the world and uh that's important to us as well um to you know to uh, people who want to get better they um i'm i'm more than happy to help them in any way that i can lots of people play play just for fun and that's fine as well don't look like look down on those people in any way or not uh at, at all but but there are people who 
are similar to me have a similar mindset that it's a strategy game that they want to get as good at, as possible at and you know I, I i'm always happy to help them in any way i can and it's definitely this shows and you you've been you know accepting interview and try to help our community and obviously this is english too so every poker community can uh you know get the value out of this interview but you know two hours i shed probably one third of the question i wanted to ask but you you put so much effort and so much uh nuggets to this interview and i cannot thank enough and thank you so much mr darrow connie as I said, I'm absolutely honored. Delight to talk to you. It's great. It's great to talk to somebody who's so passionate about poker and and interested in it. I remember ourselves when we started the chip race, how hard it was to get guests. So I really empathize with people who are starting um, uh, podcasts. I have been one of the first few guests on a lot of podcasts because I do feel a genuine sympathy for people who are starting out. It's the hardest part is the start. You know, we almost folded in the first two, uh, first 10 shows or, or so. After we ran out of friends, we could twist our arm to come on the show. We got very, very lucky when Jennifer Tilly, uh, who is a, a good friend of mine, agreed to come on the show. And I think it is important. Like I've heard people say, uh, you know, when they're asked to go on podcasts, they check, you know, what the current viewership is and who else has been on the show, et cetera, et cetera. I don't do that because, you know, everybody has to start somewhere. Mm. And um you know if, if if i can help a podcast that's starting that's far more important to me than you know a podcast that's already up and running and well established uh guys like you are great for for, for growing the game um we need uh smart enthusiastic recreational players to get across the recreational voice and to uh to reach recreations and tell them what a great game this is and um yeah so keep up the good work and uh i hope um i hope in in a few years time you'll, you'll be getting much better guests than me <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and yeah yeah I, i again like i'm i'm glad that i can be part of this journey in connecting to a uh, japanese community to someone like you know professional poker player and again uh, thank you so much thank you shinpei thank you